Hello there, welcome. Sam here, Real Love Guitars Workshop, and uh, it's kind of running up towards Christmas now. Actually, it's not that close to Christmas, but um, had a, I don't know if you can see, but I've been having some busy time here in the shed and making guitars. So we've got a couple on the make. We've got JT's uh, beautiful looking T shaped thing here with a kind of uh, pitch pine with nice grain but a nice sort of faded edge on it um, or slightly obscured edge so you can see the grain come in and go out that's now done that's been finally lacquered with or finished with the satin layer satin nitro layer and that's going to be combined with the neck that's hanging up over there down there we've got poppy um, pulls have you got some charge on this battery so let's have a look yeah just a minute. we've got pulls <coughs> poppy double cut sort of Gibson double cut style thing here that's finished the satin nitro last night as well and so that's kind of ready now to be um, basically hardware all put together and uh, electrics put in and so on and for that we've got a custom made uh, smoked oak pick guard and with a little tribute to Brian May we've got a, a little cute little not very functional but a set a cosmetic little uh, half a little pick guard there for the for the back. Um, yeah, so that's gonna that's gonna come together this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I want to leave it over the weekend, rest of the weekend to cure the the finish. Um, but this one's ready, going to be ready to go at the same time. So I'm get, aim to get both of these finished before Christmas. Um, there's JT's neck again, a, a fairly light coat of satin nitro, which gives it a not rough exactly, but a non-gloss feel, which I quite like. This one. Um, I'm waiting till I get in some more. Uh, what am I doing? I'm doing a mixture actually. I'm gonna. Hmm, I started doing with some TV yellow because I had it there. Um, I was going to do a sort of fade of, of trans red into natural colour, um, which gives me sort of a bit of a paisley pink kind of feel to it. But um, I probably might remove. I might remove this and just redo the edges in white primer. And just then dust the edges in primer. So I've got to get some primer in to do that, but it will look great. And I also need some trans red as well. So <laughs> more to do. But I've got a couple that are definitely on the go and definitely need finishing this week. But that was a quick detail. Because part of the reason for that is that my dad and stepmom are moving, I think, next weekend from Coventry to Tavistock. Um, good deal. Um, but they're moving closer to us so that we can help in his care. Um, so yeah, big deal. Um, so really I need to get those two guitars finished. That one and that one by midweek, which I'm pretty sure, sure I can do. Actually only, truthfully only Poppy, the uh, red one over there needs to be done. Some bursty one needs to be done by midweek. What I do have to do before then as well is um, Tom and Xander's Yamaha Pacifica. Um, and this is a nice old green jobby a great basic guitar. Um, I've insulted people in the past by calling this a really good starter guitar and it's, you know, the truth is this guitar exceeds my playing capabilities and probably many other people besides. So I'm not knocking it at all. It's a it's a really capable, um, well, I, I think what I should have referred to it as is budget because it definitely is budget. But it's kind of a, a Strat orientation. Um, <clears throat> I've taken the strings off already because I've done a bit of uh, quick checking on this. One of the things is that um, I know that Tom and, and Xander would appreciate uh, a tremolo arm on it and I've got some spare tremolos but unfortunately they only work with various bridges that I've got. They didn't fit this one. Um, so uh, what I looked at was the feasibility of replacing one of these bridges. Um, they're almost kind of pretty close in most dimensions actually. So we'll see if it's a a feasible replacement and the string spacing is identical just slightly different construction so what I was going to do is have a quick look at see how how these line up and perform um, and then we can cobble together various different things that whichever saddles look best or feel best this this originally came with a sort of bent steel things um, which we could they're a bit, a bit um, corroded these little grub screws so that might not be so good but in my different departments of stuff I've got tons this is a horribly light one I mean they aren't exactly heavy anyway but I wouldn't want to use that one although it does have a nice 
arm on it. Uh, but this one looks like a good replacement. It'll do the job. And the holes, providing the holes line up and the, the actual uh, tremolo block height is um, very similar. It's actually a little bit shorter than this one, um, which, which may or may not make a difference. Um, there's not a lot of uh, room, but again, we can we can also bend the arm a little bit. So if we want this, um, the idea is we can have this floating. So um, we probably want the arm a little higher to allow us a good grip to go backwards and forwards. But again, we can put that in the vise and give that a, a pull. If that doesn't work, we can always go back to the original and we'll just um, we'll have it without an arm for the time being. I mean, I do have some other ones that just fall in. They're not really they're not screwing, so they don't really work. Anyway, so. Xander, this is uh, a video kind of directed or aimed at you. This is your guitar. I saw a great video of you playing it the other day. Um, I thought you had a, a very good style about you playing it. So I'm looking forward to making this, um, upgrading this a bit for you so that you, you want to play this for years to come. Um, so what we're going to do on this is we're going to um, take it all apart. So that would be the first thing. So there's the first thing. You can see that the bridge is out along with the the back plate and the screw, uh, the springs that made it work. So we'll take that all apart. I'm going to take everything apart, give it a good clean up, check everything over, um, and then I'm going to have a look in, under, underneath here because we're going to be upgrading these pickups. Now it's not that they're bad pickups to begin with, but we, you know, your your dad wants to invest a little bit in in getting a, a nicer tone, so it's never a bad thing to add some decent well, some other pickups. Um, obviously, I can send these back, these original ones, and if you want, you ever come to sell the guitar for a different one, you can always include these in the sale if somebody wants to um, do that. So what I'll do is I'll take this all apart. We'll strip it back to absolutely nothing, so partly so you can see what your guitar is made up from. Um, it's got this pick holder on here which um, is okay it can stay on there it's only held on with a bit of um, spongy stuff we don't need to take it off to do the work um, but and the headstock is pretty clean so I'm not really gonna even bother I don't think taking the tuners off because they're they're okay you might tighten one or two of them up a little bit because they're quite loose but mainly the job will be take it all apart so you can see how it's built examine what's under here to make sure that um, there's nothing broken and that we can change things out and get the new pickups in. So we're going to have a new iron gear uh, rolling mill here. Um, that's going to be a, called a zebra coloured one, which will be a black sort of um, bobbin and a white one, or cream one. And then we're going to have two parchment coloured um, single coil pickups, also from iron gear, and they're called Texas Locos, so they're, they're quite, um, quite hot, so they'll give you a, quite a nice tone. Um, what I'll do is also clean up the fingerboard and everything, make everything nice and clean here. We'll take off this tested sticker because it's a bit naff. Um, what I'll also do is, um, bef well, well, before the pickups arrive, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the bridge back on, test it, and we're going to restring it with some old strings. And then I'm going to use those old strings to basically set up the guitar without the new pickups in it. So. Um, that will allow me to do any fret leveling that I'm going to do to make this play really low for you so that uh, you don't have to struggle to squeeze out chords here and if you do play chords down here that they'll all be in tune with each other so that's really important in my setups is that you get the uh, get the, the guitar to feel great to play um, first thing that's it's got to be actually the very first priority it's got to stay play and stay in tune right that's the important thing if it doesn't stay in tune you're not going to enjoy playing it, especially if you're going to play with other people in a band. Um, if you can't keep the guitar in tune, it's going to be a real problem. So my priority is always making sure it's, it goes and stays and plays in tune. That's the number one priority. And that's done by um, making sure these nut slots are correct. Believe it or not, despite what you might hear from friends about guitars, staying in tune doesn't really have to do anything to do with these. These are only for getting it into tune. Okay. Whether or not it stays in tune or plays in tune has to do with two main things and you can wow your friends with this knowledge and you can help them set their guitars up by the way. It, may, it depends on whether these um, nut slots, the little gaps in here, are cut to the right height to give a low first fret action and whether or not the string, they're wide enough for the string to move uh, as you bend strings and use the tremolo, the strings have to be able to move 
through the slot and back without gripping anything. Now you might not hear it gripping or even feel it gripping, but you'll know it's gripping when you play the tremolo and suddenly it's out of tune again. And you might hear a lot of your friends who've got similar guitars saying, oh, the tremolo's rubbish. I lock it down or I, I make sure it's out. I, I hard tail it, they'll say. And the truth is, the tremolo does make it go out of tune, but it's not the tremolo's fault. It's the fault of the fact that these nut slots are wrong. And it's also the fault of another thing that people don't ever look too closely at, or enough, and that's the whether or not there's stretch left in the whole of the string length from where it's wound around here right the way through where it's um, threaded through the body or through the tremolo block. If there's any, I call it residual stretch, but if there's any stretch that can be pulled, and there is a lot to begin with, um, it, people think that you might give it a little bit of a pull and then play and everything's fine. And you'll see at the end of this video that when I put your new strings on, I'll stretch the hell out of them because I'm going to make sure that all of that possible stretch is gone so that it means it's pulled as tightly as possible. All the kind of possible looseness is squeezed out of the coils that go around these. Any looseness or stretch that could be in the string itself, we've stretched out, and any kind of stretch that could be in the bridge, we've stretched it out. And if I take care of those two things, the I call it residual unreleased stretch in the strings and the nut slots okay and make sure it's got a nice f low first fret action then we're going to make sure this guitar stays and plays in tune and you'll also be able to use the tremolo bar with it if you like that sort of st sound and style and why not um, that will also ensure that you can use that without it going radically out of tune each time you do it okay so that's the plan um, what I'm also going to do is take care of that first. Um, the second priority for me is that it feels good for you to play. So we don't want a big high action up here um, and you don't want a big high action down here. So I'm going to take care of both of those. The reason why um, budget or no, actually not even budget guitars, the reason why most guitars come to you with a high action down here particularly but also here is uh, but when, it, when it's down here the high action is usually because any lower and what, what you'll find is that very subtly uneven frets along here, the lower you go with your action at this end, which makes it feel nice to play, the lower you go, the more likely slight uneven frets here, maybe one a little bit higher than the other, which you'll get when, the, when they're, they're pressed into the neck in the factory. Those little tiny differences, the lower you get with your action, they'll suddenly start to count and you'll be playing in something and you'll hear a buzz and you'll hate it. And it'll, it'll be um, you wouldn't be able, and sometimes it chokes the note completely so you can't play it. And what happens then is that the owner of the guitar tends to take the height up of the bridge by um, adjusting the saddles uh, to the point where you can't hear that buzzing anymore. And that's why most guitars come pretty much set at their lowest action before uh, you run into fret buzz from uneven frets. So the, the second priority of making it play easily we've made the first one is making it stay in tune the second priority is making it play nice and light for you so it's low and fast is to always have to take care of the frets all right um, if you don't take care of the frets the frets will dictate how low your action can be and you can't get around it you may get uh, your action nicely lowered to a point where you think great i can play all these notes actually that's fine and it's a nice low action but as soon as you bend, when, when you get further into playing, you, you want to bend notes for playing solos and things. As soon as you bend, you'll find the note chokes off as you bend it, because it's also running into a slightly high fret somewhere in front of it. So to make sure that all the notes play cleanly, and you can bend them without them choking or buzzing, we have to uh, fret level, or level these frets with a technique that I I've learned how to do, which is really quite cool, and you, you could actually do it yourself in future as well if you watch the video all the way through. So, um, the first thing I'm going to do, just for fun, what am I going to do? I'm going to take the take the neck off. Actually, yeah, I'm going to do it just for fun, so you can see what's there, how it works. All right. And what I'll do is, while I'm doing that, I'll talk through anything I can think of um, that's kind of interesting on about how the neck works in relation to the guitar. So you you will hear, if you get further into guitars, you'll hear an argument 
about, I've got one over there but it's hanging out, um, but you'll hear people discussing the merits of what's called bolt-on guitars like this where the neck is held on by these four bolts and pulling into this plate um, or set neck guitars where the neck joint is glued in, the neck is glued into the body there clamped and then when it sets then they paint over it and it's a, it's a set or a glued neck and there are people who will argue till the cows come home that a set neck is better than a, uh, than a bolted neck. Now if that were true then Fender would never have made its contribution to rock and roll history. It's clear that a bolt-on neck works really well and Yamaha wouldn't be making this guitar with all their fantastic experience of making guitars they wouldn't make bolt-on neck guitars if that were true. So when you get further into guitars you'll find there are loads of strange go the right way. You'll find there are loads of strange stories or beliefs about things to do with guitars. Um, and what you'll find is that the people who hold those beliefs hold them really passionately. Um, so much so that on forums and stuff online you'll, you'll sometimes hear them not only not only arguing the case for what they believe but you'll also hear them um, very quickly get into unpleasant rude arguments you know um, abusive arguments people get really uptight about it so I just if you get further into guitars remember that a lot of what you'll hear about guitars is I call it dogma it's stuff that people haven't really found out through practice and experience what they've done is they've heard somebody they kind of respect and look up to in a forum say it and because that person said it and they respect them they've taken it as gospel or it's the dogma you know you don't question it you just believe it so an example of that dogma is the argument that says bolt-on necks are terrible and set necks are good it's not true at all they also say that bolt-on necks have less you know, produce less sustain in the notes than set or glued necks which is also not true but nobody likes to know that so this is your yeah, so that's just an example of one of the dogmas, many dogmas. And all I'd say about those is just don't believe anything just because somebody said it, right? I recommend that you, if you can't get direct experience of it, like play one that's got a set neck, play one that's got a bolt on neck, and see if you can really hear the difference, right? If you can't, then you've got good reason to question what someone's telling you, and then, then have the courage to stick with your doubt about it, right? And find out try some more see if you can compare and if you find out that actually either this is more sustained or you can't actually hear a difference then reject the dogma don't believe it just because all your mates do because it takes a kind of courage to reject it and to find out or to be willing or to want to find out for yourself and you'll find loads of issues I might mention a couple as we go through about where the dogma kicks in now, that was a good catch um, that's how your neck comes out of the pocket a little bit unexpected but there you go that's how it fits in so your neck heel it's got Pacific uh, or pack 112 that's the model it's got these four holes in there and this um, this nice flat bit here the heel is what sits snugly against the body and then is pulled in by these four screws and that plate and you've got a, a tested thing because this may have come from a school or a I don't know a second-hand shop or something where they've checked everything so you know, for home use, you don't really need one of those. It's a bit ugly. So, what is your neck? Your neck is a piece of maple with a nice grain, usually the grain running long ways. Um, and then you get some, sometimes you get what's called flame effects, where the wood has a nice kind of 3D f flame feeling. Uh, it kind of looks pretty. This isn't too bad, it's, but it's nice maple. Yamaha, really good quality materials. And on top of that, you've got a rosewood fingerboard. Okay. Now, rosewood these days is uh, you can't buy guitars with this stuff in it anymore. Well, you can from China, but you're not supposed to. There's a new regulation brought in a year or so ago to protect this wood species because it's it's um, threatened. So when you have an old guitar like this, you're, you're, it's like a bit like having an I ivory or something forbidden. This is now a forbidden wood. This rosewood protected by what's called the sites regulations to protect the species of that that tree 
they're making alternatives to this now, so new guitars, if they're from China, for example, where they don't care about that regulation, I'm not saying they all don't care, but a lot of the manufacturers don't, um, you'll find a lot of these will still appear on your doorstep if you buy something direct from China with rosewood on. But the, the European, American responsible manufacturers will be sourcing alternatives to this. And you have things like Pau Ferro, which is a different kind of rosewood, which isn't, um, which isn't so threatened. You have stuff called, how do they call it? Blackwood. St uh, stuff called roasted, um, roasted maple, stuff like that. So they're using alternatives now. But this is good old fashioned rosewood. And some people won't play anything else, they love it. But some people are happy playing the other kind. Um, typical, typical neck that you'll see on other similar guitars, which is uh, uh, just a maple neck. It's, in this case, it's constructed the same way. It has a, a, a neck, a basic body of the neck and with a thinner layer of maple on top. Sometimes they're made from just one single piece, um, but this isn't subject to restrictions. So I could send, I could, I'm putting this in, putting this into, this is working with that guitar, and I could sell that in the, in the US or outside of the EU because, uh, because it's not rosewood. So that's just the different kinds of woods that currently are being used. Um, and what's good about this is your frets are pressed in, so they have a little tang and they're pressed into the rosewood. Underneath the rosewood, and the end of it sits here under that little cover, is your truss rod. And your truss rod is something that is a piece of metal, it's got two parts to it, but it, in short it allows you to control the amount of bend that happens in the neck when you put the strings on. Because the neck is wood and it likes to bend like a bow, an arrow would bend. Um, not as much as a bow, but it's uh, it'll bend some some amount and the truss rod allows you to um, bend a piece of metal in a way that that stops the bending of this and sometimes reverses it so it flattens it out and our job in the setup and your job as an owner is to adjust it to what you want now there's a lot of myths about this people people they all conspire to make everyone terrified of adjusting this okay you would have to go a long way to break that metal bar inside your guitar neck and it's it's built like usually something like this um, if I can undo it so you've got a you've got a, a round rod um, with a screw arrangement and the, on the underside welded to another end is a flat bar and they're separate you can't really see the gap very well unless I pull it apart um, and then the other end of the bar is attached um, or it's not where it's welded the other end of the bar is not attached to this end of the rod, it's, it's on a little um, cylinder and that means this end, this cylinder can move and you put that cylinder under pressure by tightening up the screw and it tries to push this little moving cylinder attached to the bar that way but because it's metal it can't shrink so it has to bend and so the, the bar bends that way and that's what that bending is what you use, what you use to control the um, counter the bend in your neck but you can see it's made of solid metal with welds pretty much either end you would have to go some length to try and break that now some of them are old and they break on their own um, but you by t turning it you would you would know you're about to shear off and that's pretty much all you can do is if you over tighten it really hard you'll sh you may shear off that screw um, that, that cylinder that screws in and that's about all you can do that's not good news if you do that but the point being is you'd have to go a hell of a long way with muscles to do that. So people, a lot of people when they're starting out playing guitar get terrified of making that adjustment because there's all sorts of myths about what you can do to your guitar. All you'll do to your guitar is you'll change the bend in this neck, right? That's all you'll do. Or you, if, you, if you get Charles, um, Charles, Charles, Charles Aznavour, he's a singer, Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody, or, you know, to, to pull on this right with the allen key you might snap it off that's all you can do but up to that point the worst you'll do is just change the bend in the neck and you'll see it and that's much better that you try that even down the line or maybe on another guitar or whatever but don't, don't be afraid to have a go sometime in the future of adjusting this and what you'll see is you'll curve the neck and there'll be a bigger gap between the strings and the, and the frets or you'll flatten the neck and it'll feel much easier to play but if you flatten it too much you may end up with the strings touching the frets or if you flatten it so far that it goes the opposite way 
you may end up um, not being able to play notes down here because the string's sitting permanently somewhere in the middle because it's a hill and it's touching the strings. But you can constantly adjust it, and in some cases you have to because weather conditions change. Um, it, um, it might be drier and colder where you live, in which case the neck will behave differently. And even though I set it up as carefully as I can, excuse me, you might need to make an adjustment by the time it reaches your environment. Just had that recently, um, sold a custom built guitar to Mike in Switzerland, and I set it up here to, to this condition. Now, here we've got today, um, we've got 13 degrees in the shed, which is pretty warm, I suppose, by certain standards, cold by others, but we've got 93% humidity in the shed. So, um, and this is fairly common most of the year round for England or Great Britain. So, when it got to Mike halfway up the, um, the Swiss Alps in a very dry place with I think lower temperature um, the neck changed shape so he had to give it a couple of days to to stabilize it and it kind of curved more and then he had to dial it back with the truss rod so you have to use it and that's what it's there for the rule of thumb is that the strings need a tiny bit of space uh, or a little bit of curvature in the neck to allow the strings to kind of flail around in the middle if you have it totally flat, you can still play, but if you hit it hard, you'll hear it string, you'll hear the strings slapping the frets very easily. If you have too much, you won't get that string slap, but you, your action in the middle of the net will feel really high. There's a few things. But again, subject to myths, right? You'll hear people with all manner of views about what's good and bad to do. So looking at this neck, um, I'll clean this up later. Uh, it's currently got a plastic nut on the end of here, and uh, it's a bit of a, an interesting one. It's not a Strat style nut. It's more of a, um, a Les Paul style. Um, now we could we could either replace this with, or we could either leave it and see if it, see if we can make it work. Um, plastic's okay. It's not bad stuff to use. What matters is that the slots are correct and that, and give the right first fret action. Um, if it's really important to somebody to leave the black nut on there, then I do it and I work do my best to get the, the correct actions and the correct um, width of the slots. Uh, but it might not be possible, so we might be ready to replace it out with a bone one, which is I find easier to cut to get the right first right action. But the nut is critical because of that thing about the tuning and about the action. So we're going to clean this somewhere along the line. There's a bit of wear on these frets, um, but nothing major. It's just, it's just where the strings have been pressed down on the frets many many times. The fingerboard is good, a little bit dirty, so we'll clean all of that up in the process of doing the setup. All right, so I won't, I won't worry about it too much now. So here we have our body. There's a hole there where the tremolo goes through, the tremolo block goes through, which is obviously where it can move backwards and forwards. The, the block moves like that when you get your fingers stuck. When you use the tremolo it has to be able to move like that. And the springs are attached to here, which is what allows the thing to return to where it's supposed to. So you have to have that hole there. Um, what we'll do now, for fun, is we'll take out the screws and have a look under the cover um, and see what we've got. Now, to do this, we're going to end up with a couple of wires that we'll probably need to cut. We will need to cut because... Um, let's find another screw head, driver head. We'll need to cut the... Um, wires because we have to replace the pickups anyway so we'll need the pick guard off that's not the right one we also don't need it on there in order to do the main setup stuff we can do that with no electrics at all and that's what I wanted now these these screws are a bit on the rusty side so I think I'll probably replace them for you when you get rusty screws on a guitar like this, what you're really hoping for is that they don't shear off when you try to take the pick guard off. Um, so that's my first relief is if they come out at all. I've had some guitars in the past where the water damage or the damp to these little screws has been so severe that the, every single one of them sheared off when I tried to undo it. Basically because the metal, uh, the metal of the screw, which is pretty soft metal anyway, had degraded and gave up. Stopped pretending to be a screw and turned into a little, little, uh, little mushy sea of rust, which often happens. So 
all of your pickups and your electrics are held on the back of this plate called the scratch plate and um, it's kind of pretty primitive it's it's essentially the same been the same since uh, the sort of 1950s and there it is all living under there now we have, we have a couple of things which I will chop off right now because I can solder them back when we put everything together anyway so I'll cut them off so the first one is there's a ground wire that goes to the claw and that helps to ground the bridge because the claw is connected to the bridge the springs and then the bridge it means that you're electrically grounded when you touch the bridge with your hand which you will do now down the the other connection we're going to take off is the jack socket connection which sits here um, I quite like this style on, on a lot of strats so you've probably seen that it's like a socket on top there um, which is quite it's quite a good quite a good idea the fender's idea was pretty good because when you put it on there the the, the lead goes in at a, at a slanted angle and it's quite hard to break here because the jack, jack goes in at a straight angle, there's a lot of forces levered on here every time you move around, unless you always put it through your strap. But even then, there's a bit of force. So that on guitars like this, this um, connection under here quite often breaks. It's quite common. And it's one of the first things to look for if your guitar suddenly stops making a noise. Now what I'm going to do just for now is I'm just going to, because I don't want to heat up my soldering iron just yet, I'm just going to snip that off. Now that is the, those, I should say, are the two things that are keeping this scratch plate anchored to the body. So I'll show you first of all what the body looks like. That's routed out by a machine and it's called, this is, they call this a swimming pool route. Some guitars they have much smaller pockets for each of the type of pickup like sometimes it's three single coils and there'll be wood in between to give the body more weight. This is routed out for, um, for any kind of pickup combination and that's deliberate so they can put maybe they could put a different scratch plate on with I don't know three P90s or two two humbuckers and a, a single coil in the middle so it gives them a lot of flexibility in um, configurations that's why they do it that's where your switching stuff lives down inside that cavity there so it's really simple and with some holes on a lot of guitars not this one but this is can be a very weak point here um, on a lot of guitars some guitars particularly ones where there's, there's a different kind of tremolo fixing with only two anchor points instead of these six sometimes this piece breaks and splits across here um, quite a lot of fenders have, I've seen with that and quite a lot of squires because this tends to be much thinner it's like a little wooden bridge it's all part of this but because it's thin it's weak and it can snap off but this is a good solid one so you shouldn't have any problems there so that's basically your guitar and it's made of I think basswood which is pretty light but perfectly good and people will give you more more myths here we go people will say basswood oh horrible no it's not tone wood you'll hear the word tone wood and there are some people who who believe there are certain kinds of woods that are just brilliant compared to other kinds of woods um, a lot of people myself included don't go for that we don't believe that the wood directly contributes to the sound but you know the bottom line is until you have direct experience yourself that it does, don't don't assume or don't believe that it does. Question, you know, question it, be skeptical, and then if you decide in your own mind that alder or alder or whatever it's called or ash or something, you, you know, makes the best tone for you, and you've tried so many different combinations that you know it's the wood as far as you're concerned, then then go for that kind of wood. I don't particularly go for that I, I'm happy to play anything which is why I make things out of oak and pitch pine and ecky which is a favorite of mine which is uh, a wood that's about twice as dense as mahogany anyway so here are your original pickups in here um, this is made by S Sam Shin um, never heard that but it's a Chinese thing um, which is no bad thing um, so basically you've got your pickup which is a magnetic or a piece of a block of magnet here um, touching the base of these coils which go all the way through the pickup and stick out the top and around all those coils is an endless not an endless but a very long loop of copper very thin copper wire and the same applies here just two of them side by side connected together um, and that's your pickups and so it's and there's magnets under there 
and, and those are what produce the tone of your guitar or the signal from your guitar. And then there's your switch, that's a five way Fender switch. These are quite a budget, they're small pots, um, no bad thing, they, you know, it's not the end of the world. Pot, big pots, so again, it was one of these things, people like big pots, full size pots they call them. Um, I would not put my hand on my heart and tell you I could ever hear the difference between a big pot and a small pot just for that. Um, so don't worry about it. The bigger contribution to your tone, to what comes out of your amp, two things. It's one, this, and two, uh, this little green capacitor here which takes off or allows through the high frequencies depending on where the tone knob is set. And the other thing that makes a big difference to the tone is uh, your amplifier and how that colours the sound. So those things make far more difference um, than whether you're using a uh, big full size pot or a small size pot. Those are m m marginal differences. Now what we've got here is we've got a fairly simple pickup so um, what we have is, I always have to remind myself of this because sometimes this changes, changes, and it doesn't change. I, I always forget, I'm not a very good memory, I always forget which one of these things is the, the correct place where the bridge and the middle go. So what happens is, on these, Let's take the let's take the middle pickup, right? The middle pickup comes down here and splits into two wires. One goes to the common earth on top of the volume pot, and the other one, the hot signal, which is the actual signal that uh, the pickup's making because your string has been struck and it's waggling around. That signal comes down here into the middle position on the switch. Okay. Um, all I care about right now is where does the the neck pickup go? And the neck pickup goes to the outside. So I'm just going to write a little mark on here for the neck, so I just know which is which, because I always forget. I know it's really simple, but the neck is the outside one. Now I know where the others go. Now. Um, and so they go through the switch. The switch does what it wants to do in dividing them up or combinations of them. And then the output from the switch, this red one, goes to the input to the pot. Um, that's the volume pot. That determines how loud or, or quiet the signal is. And Attached to that all times is the tone pop which either drains off or allows through the treble depending on where you've got it set and that's what the job of the capacitor is in conjunction with the pot. So that is the massive complexity of what lives under your hood. Now we're going to take out all of these pickups so what I'm going to, just going to do is I'm just going to snip them for now because we don't need them right now. I'm also going to snip this big combined tangle of ground earth wires because they were all put together from all the earths can always go together you see they're bare wires so they were all put together on the top of this pot which itself is earthed through your cable to your amplifier through your amplifier to your wall plug through your wall plug back out to a piece of metal that goes into the ground outside your house basically that's why it's called earth I learned that's pretty good so that's your three pickups disconnected and we just want to take them out now and what I'll do is clean up the stuff uh, clean up the pick guard a bit these screws that currently are holding the pickups are also a bit on the way of the rusty side but we're going to get new ones with the new pickups so we can discard those but we, we won't discard them we'll put them with the pickups for you but it means that we lose them and they won't show up and there you go look cover off there's your bobbin with your um, your blocks of steel, not steel, ferrous metal going through there um, and then this is a bit of sealing tape but underneath that tape is all the copper wire it's very pretty um, but it's very easy to break so if you're ever playing around with a pick, um, pickup and actually most importantly of all not on this one, this is a simpler pickup but on modern pickups where there's lots of different wires you'll have, and that's why there's little holes here you'll have a blob of solder in those holes and the two ends of the copper coil will come out and these tiny hair thin wires will stick out here and run over the top of here and then come out to your controls. Um, those wires are incredibly easy to break if you handle it roughly or as you're putting it onto the pit guard. I did it once and once only. And that's, yeah, it was about 30 pounds worth of breakage so um, I thought well, right, I'm never going to do that again. So I learned the hard way, which is how I learn most things. So there's your middle pickup. And what I'll do, just for what it's worth, I will write neck, 
middle, and then the bridge is kind of it doesn't even say it says rhythm on here, and which is no, it's just, that's mm, that's interesting. It says R, but I'm going to call that bridge. R is usually um, rhythm, which is usually in a neck position. So um, I don't quite know what the choice was there, but that's what they put in that position. These screws, as you can see, allow you to raise and lower the pickups anyway. And when you've got your guitar back with the new pickups, I'll set them for a sort of a standard height that people advise of three millimeters underneath the string. Um, but you can, at a later date, you can raise them or lower them and you'll find that doing so will, will sometimes give you more output. It'll seem a little bit louder. Um, but if you go a little bit louder, then some people say that it's at the expense of tone or dynamic of the tone. So, you know, some people are happy for that exchange and some people prefer a lower output um, with a bit more dynamic to the tone. But again, it's one of those things you really got to try out for yourself and see if you can tell the difference and if the difference is worth worrying about for you. And again, because it's a matter of raising and lowering the pickups, Providing we're not touching the strings, which will stop the strings playing, there's no harm at all in trying. And it's better, I think, that you try it out and see what the difference is so you'll know for yourself instead of people telling you, because you prob probably know that relying on people telling you in this day and age is not a good thing. Um, since everybody's got their own opinion and sometimes it's harder these days to tell which opinion's got any um, credibility or yeah you know since everyone's got an opinion and everyone thinks their opinion is the right one now I, I I try not to be like that I just the only thing I say is I do what I do because through experience it seems to make sense to me but I never say it's the right way or the wrong way to do something I just say it's how I um, how I choose to do something for these reasons but you may disagree with them that's absolutely fine um, but that's how I like to go about it. Um, I still get people who want to argue um, as if I'm saying it's the only way. Um, but I try very hard not to engage with them. Now this is stuff called naphtha. It's a, it's a safe, a pretty inert solvent that you can use on guitar plastics and guitar finishes without doing any harm to them. And it's also very good for cleaning uh, the grease off the neck, so it will kind of lift the grease. Um, it will, but it will also, when when I do the neck later on with this, um, it, it'll also slightly dry the neck out a bit. So once we use it on the neck, we'll also want to add a bit of oil at the end just to darken the neck. I keep wanting to use the word hydrate, but of course it's not hydration because it's oil, not water. You know what I'm saying. Now the same thing applies, oh, I shouldn't have put that back, same thing applies here with the body. Um, I'm going to give it a quick rub down with this stuff and this will lift off the ma main gunge that's built up over the years, usually just under the edge of the pit guard, which you can't see but I like to get rid of it anyway because it's a nice, nice feeling to have a clean guitar. So just as a start point I can just slap, slap this stuff on and it, whoa, Try and get away from me, um, but it's really good at cleaning off sort of built-in grease. Now, if there's scratches, sometimes you quite often you get um, house paint stri uh, sort of streaks on guitars where they've been banged off, um, dropped against the walls and things. And yay, in the hole! Uh, you, you can really spoil the look of the guitar, and it, you can sort of you start to think that you'll never clean it up or it'll never come off, but actually you can get some guitar polishing stuff, which isn't cheap, but it's absolutely brilliant for, it will remove that sort of those kind of house paint stripes that you often get on the tail end of guitars where you bonk them against the bedroom wall or something. Um, yeah, you got that one then. Hey, doing well. Olympic uh, rubbish scrunched up paper throwing contest. Okay, so it's all in bits, as you can see. Um, this is a nice condition neck, nothing I really need to do with this just now, but 
I am going to put this back together again because first job on this guitar is going to be the setup part if I can just hold this in place long enough. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back, get me more screws here. I'm going to get the correct bit in the screwdriver and I'm going to push one of these <laughs> with one hand usually get this to work through the hole and then put it up to there. Now when you're putting these in you don't want to put too much load on it first you just want to let it go in gently until it holds the plate and partly what that does is it allows the um, it allows the neck to move into position and to align itself with the screws so everything's kind of in position where it was before. On a well-made guitar like these Yamahas are, this neck should go perfectly into alignment and shouldn't have any problem with the strings kind of wandering down off one side or the other as they go down the neck. With some guitars, quite a lot of bolt-on guitars, you'll find that people have, even in the factory, have put the neck on a bit carelessly such that the strings are either all practically hanging off one side of the fingerboard or the other. Um, in which case, the very nice thing about the bolt-on neck is that you yourself can undo these bolts, take most of them out, leave one in, and then just move the neck to where you want it with the strings on. And you, you kind of be able to push it this way or pull it that way and hold it in position and do up a couple of the screws and then you'll have the strings perfectly aligned and then do them all up tight. And that will give you the correct alignment. So there's a bit of flexibility in that which you don't get with the bolted neck. If somebody supplies you a guitar with a bolted neck, sorry, a glued neck, glued in neck, a set neck as they call it. If you get a guitar with a set neck where the strings are slightly too far off and they just feel like they're falling off the edge of one side or the other, there's not a lot you can do with it apart from move the bridge. So when I'm making one, I glue the neck in first, make sure that's really solid, then I position the bridge as the last thing in that, that order so that once the neck is where it's going to be, I then I never position the bridge holes or the post holes before the neck's on. With a, as I say, with a, um, I kind of do the same with a bolt-on guitar, but um, you, you don't have much choice. If you get one through the post and you bought it with the bridge, with the strings kind of hanging off this side and they're too near the edge and they slip off, and it's a it's a set neck guitar, send it back. Don't accept it because the only solution you're going to get for that is to move. Um, move the whole bridge position which is going to be very difficult. Okay so my my um, plan here is to refit one of these bridges that I think is going to work. Now I don't write, don't mind for now um, that this is a bit of a um, dirty one because I'll tidy it up later on um, when, when the time is necessary, if time is right. Um, let me just tip out these things which I'll need which is six of these tremolo tremolo screws they're called and you can spot them from the others because they have a domed head and a, and a clear bit before the screw and the domed head is important because that is what the front edge of the tremolo uh, tends to pivot against so it wouldn't work if it was screwed all the way it had threads all the way to the top so first thing is I'm just going to make sure because I'm doing another, using another bridge, my first priority is to make sure they all line up properly. It would be no good if it's just even the tiniest bit tight because then the bridge won't freely move. So they have to be the right size to begin with. Now I'm just attaching two to begin with, the outside ones, and I'm going to tighten them up until I see them start to pull the front of the bridge down like that. I don't want that, so I'm going to undo it I'm probably better doing that by hand actually just for that little bit more control over it so I want it to I want it to come right down to the plate but just start to move it down I can feel when it does because I'm holding the tremolo arm up now it's moving it now it's not so there's my sort of start point now obviously this is a bit rattly but it will tighten up as we get more of those screws in and providing they're in the right place this will be simple so again I'll go back to the electrical thing which makes things a bit easier and I'll just use that to do the bulk of the work and I'll stop a bit before the end 
um, and I'll just use the manual screwdriver to do the last bit again so I don't get any pulling forward of the plate. Now, the reason the plate pulls forward is because it's designed with a little chamfer on the front edge of the plate which is precisely to allow it to ride up on the little angle um, and that's what that's what it that's what allows it to do its work as a tremolo. If it was just a flat straight bar kind of shaped like that um, it couldn't really couldn't really sit up on this edge it would clunk the edge here would clunk so the little little chamfer I don't know how to describe it a little upward chamfer in here allows it but you, you can see it there it thins down so it allows that bit to press down without grinding on the top of the guitar. So I'm going to do the same thing here with these just to make sure it's nice and securely in go until it sort of starts to bite the the plate and there it is and then back off go there until it starts to bite the plate there it is back off and the same again and that ensures a really good fit a really tight hold um, but none of it so that it's so loose that it's riding further than it should so that's quite a good way of doing it with the arming because you can really feel it better than you can feel there so now we've got what looks to me like a fairly good range of movement on the trem um, it's a shorter block so technically it should be able to travel even further if we wanted it to but there is a limit to how far it will travel anyway because it's going to hit the hit the rear of the thing now I'll just check check it against the original to see how different the dimensions are and I think it's got the same amount of travel judging by this um, yeah I think that's as far as it would ever go on this one as well which is fine you wouldn't you're not going to get sort of uh, heavy rock dive bombing going on with this kind of tremolo not on this guitar and you'd, you'd have to have a different kind of guitar for that so what we do then is we flip over to this side and probably it might just be easier for a minute to remove hold on remove the arm uh, bashing your fingers so Xander, this setup that I'm doing here it normally takes about three hours, um, it, probably including the pickup exchange because the swapping over the pickups on this are going to be fairly straightforward. Um, even though I think there'll be more wires on the new pickup um, pickups because they're they're designed to be have various different cute things like coil splits and so on going on. Um, they have that option with the humbucker, for example, which you don't have with this simpler one. Um, but you know we're just going to do a fairly straight swap out without putting any extra um, functionality on. I'm just looking at the, the fit of these things. These are the Yamaha screws going into uh, the Squire. I think it is probably. They don't go all the way in, but they go far enough in to work, and I don't think there'll be a problem um, if necessary. No, I think that'll be okay. That'll be okay. So now we can put the arm back in. Now these, now, now this whole thing now is under spring tension. So currently, you'll see it's sitting flat because the springs are pulling it back down against the body, which is where you'd expect it. So here we have the arm now starting to do its work. A nice squeaking noise. Now that I'm just looking at this. Okay, now that's yeah, that's why it's doing it. Okay, that's the downside of the shorter block. So, unless I can find, that is a, that's a short one too. Okay, so we've got a slight limitation now. This may be what stops us using the tremolo on this, um, unless we find one that fits, but I'll have to measure, I'll have to measure the, I can't, it's quite difficult to measure the thread on here because I can't actually see it. Um, yeah, the, the problem with a shorter block is that it holds the strings too close to this piece of wood here. Right, so that the springs um, grind against this block here when they operate. If it had nothing else, then I would just gently chisel that away so it clears. But I'm not going to do that for the sake of the fact that we're trying to replace an entire bridge for the sake of getting a tremolo arm in, which isn't um, it isn't the right one for the thing. Now, what I'll do is I'm going to remove this again because that tells me it's not going to work. Um, kind of hard to know unless you 
try it out first. You could measure everything exactly, but it would be a little bit difficult to see. So trial and error, that's telling me it's it's going to end up with springs grinding against the wood unless I start carving away. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really keen to do that. What I'm going to do is take this one off and I'm going to have a look and see if there's any way I can put one together um, or find, find any other tre uh, tremolo arms I've got around here. I might have a couple more. I'll have to go offline and hunt for them. And technically speaking, I could, I've got a tap and die set, I could actually make a, a new thread. That would be quite an interesting challenge for me because I've never actually done that. I've got this tap and die set, but I never actually used it. And we could continue using the original bridge. Problem is, I don't know what the gauge is of this. So it would probably be better to tap this out and make a new one. So I'm going to pause for a minute while I solve this problem either with the correct size arm if I can find where I kept my other ones I have a few more floating around somewhere um, or I tap and die, uh, tap this out and put a new size in because I've got two that fit here that's the one I really wanted to use which is a nice cream one that would more than likely fit with your colors of your new pickups and this one kind of doesn't, doesn't I don't think it wants to go on there. So what I'm going to do, this is part of the cleaning process anyway, so we're kind of having a pause now because I'm now going to take apart the original bridge to get at the plate and have a look at the actual thread of everything. And that's okay because I'd need to take this apart to clean all these parts anyway. So taking all the saddles off. Now the nice thing about this is You'll see in the setup process how to set the height of each of the saddles, and and um, I guess you'll you'll also see at what height to set them at. So we'll find out about that, and we'll also um, we'll also see how to intonate it, intonate each string, which means moving the saddle backwards and forwards. So it doesn't matter that we've lost all those original positions because I'll always assume that it may well be wrong anyway um, and we'll come back and redo it. So all of this is redoable from scratch. Now what I've got here is the plate that sits on top and go the right way. Three little countersunk, I don't know what they call these bolts, they're all bolts rather than screws because they've got little flat ends on them, they don't have a point. And these three bolts hold the base plate with its chamfered edge you see onto the block which is in this case made of a kind of zinc alloy which is unfortunately is a little bit brittle um, now here in lives the uh, tremolo screw threading bit um, and I would like ideally to make this fit that unless I can find an actual thing now if I go in if this is just shoved into there which you might be able to do. Chances are it may split that, so we don't want to do that. Um, have I just taken apart the wrong thing? Oh, wait a minute. Ah. What am I doing? Uh, okay, let's just, let me just think here. That one's short, although it's a nicer, heavier one. This one is the same size, because this came off a Yamaha, um, but it's much, it feels lighter. So this one does... Okay, watch me. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these off because this isn't doing anything for me at the moment, it's just sitting in a box. And we might also want the, um, the little grub screws to replace out yours because yours are corroded. So they look corroded at the moment, we shall see. Okay. So I'll just take that all apart for a minute. I'm just going to tip those all out, same thing. and. So we have your original plate here actually matches up almost identically because as I say I think it was um, I think it was a, a Yamaha anyway. That's why they're identical. Yep. But for some reason this one fits the hole. Okay, 
So that's the death note. We can use this plate, but what we'll do is we'll use this plate and we'll put your we'll use this tremolo block and we'll put your screws on it. Uh, sorry, your saddles. And let's take this off and just have a quick look. And just for fun, let's match it up with your plate. this is a nice match. That's interesting. Is that a dead match? No. Hmm. It is interesting. So that doesn't match up. It would have to be this plate. But what we know is, we know is that the screws and everything match up. Well, sorry, the uh, tremolo screws match up perfectly. Um, different size hole. Okay, well, we'll stick with this. Oh, what I'll do first of all, while I'm here, I think, as I would like to, uh, if I can find it, is just clean it out with a bit of autosol polish, which of course I now can't find. Is it in this jar over here? Yes, it is. Thank you. So, this is a little bit of a little bit of um, metal polish, which use a dirty rag for it, which I can use to clean up this plate, give it a fresh lease of life, as good as it can be. So I'd, identical to the other one, the only difference being is um, this plate is a little bit, uh, tiny different position of the tremolo arm, which isn't going to be a problem for us. Um, and it's also, overall, just a fraction lighter, which isn't a brilliant thing, but under the circumstances, it's, it's probably the best we can do if we want to use a tremolo, well, it's the only thing we can do if we want to use a tremolo arm. I'm not entirely sure I want to uh, tap yours out in case I split it ah, in the process, because it is zinc alloy, and it's not really metal, if you get what I mean. It's a sort of pretend, it is, it's an alloy but it's, it's actually slightly weak. Mm, so there's a difference in those in those weights. Well, uh, we've got a choice. We can, if it goes wrong, we can always replace this out. Is that intact? That's intact, that's intact, that's all intact. Okay, so it's an option. Let's put this back on. Here, we'll use your slightly cleaner looking bolts, if that's possible. Yep, they seem to fit okay. So as a rule, you'd, 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 well, okay. The rule says, the, the, the word on the street says, the more solid and the more mass your bridge has, the better it is for. Um, it's just slightly fractionally thinner, isn't it? The more mass your bridge has, I'll go back to the originals. They're slightly shorter countersink. Uh, the more mass your bridge has, the more sus more sustain it can create for your strings. Um, again, it would be hard to notice. I suggest on this guitar, but that's the principle. So. If I had my way, I'd prefer a, a more solid or a heavier uh, tremolo unit, heavier block. Um, but we don't have any way of doing that and having a, a tremolo arm at the moment. Because uh, short of trying to really go pot luck and buy one offline and say it's for a Pacifica and the problem with that is that everybody says, yeah, mine's for a Pacifica, and then it, for some reason it doesn't fit. And you can be... I guess the point is that this wouldn't be coming back before Christmas if we had to go through that game. So, under the circumstances, I'm going to recommend we go with the slightly lighter bridge with a tremolo arm, um, or slightly lighter of the two. Uh, what I'll do in the meantime, since I'm going to... We could, since we know we can use this one, I'm going to put your saddles back on that one. What I'll do is I'll try and, off camera, I'll try and I'll have a go at counter, uh, uh, cutting a, 
a new thread on this one. Um, and I may be able to measure it from the tremolo arm and we'll see. Now, if I can make this one work with the tremolo arm, I'll replace it with this one, which is slightly heavier. But we have this fall back. So that's going to go with that. That's going to go out of the way because it's not good to anyone. And what we've got then is a bunch of these little screws that need to come out um, and clean up. So again, part of the slow fiddly thing is to take them apart. Might as well do it. It's got to be done. And if I don't do them now, I'll have to do them later in the process, which is just just delaying it for the time being. We need the a little hex key that will work with these um, little tiny grub screws that live in here. So each of these saddles has two of these grub screws for raising and lowering the saddle. Now I'm going to try and push them all the way through first so that the, the uh, what's the word, corroded bit kind of comes, goes through. Now it sound, might sound strange but what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get them to cut, get the thread to cut the, um, cut some of the corrosion off as it goes through. And it um, sounds a bit weird but it does work. So you use the, use the thread of the um, thing as a kind of saw. And then once it's cut some of that corrosion through, it sort of does it what and recuts the thread. And then I'm going to put a bit of grease on once I've cleaned them up. And that will make sure that they go through next time pretty smoothly. Now this one is actually corroded, so I don't think we can even get a key in there. Wow, well, what happened there? That's a bit weird. Uh, and this might, I'm going to have to pull this one out with the pliers. So we may have to find a replacement. Where's my little grippers? <laughs> this, this, once I've pulled it out this way, it may still appear to be usable, but if we can't get the hex key in that end bit, then there's no point in using it because it's just going to be, it's going to be counterproductive. No shortage of these things, they're everywhere. Um, I think with this one I'll lose that one as well because it seems to be similarly gummed up. Yeah, as with these, they're not good. What it looks like is somebody's put, maybe cleaned it with some, I don't know, um, paste or something in the past and it's gone in and sort of filled up and become a bit of a plug in the end of these things. They're not impossible but they are a bit crappy so we might as well use something fresh. In fact I'll take them out of I'll take them out of this set here which probably will work better. Let's go through. So this is really taking everything to bits to give it as much of a chance of playing and staying in good nick for the next few years. That's what I like to do. One more. Um, and for me, one of the nicer things you can do, or one of the things you can do without too much extra time and effort, is to clean up the bridge, so that you know it comes at least comes back with a, a shine on it. Why not? It's going to get dusty and mucky over time, but even these are little things here, you know, can get. Don't even need to have the polish on them. Just get a bit of a, a bit of a cloth to them. Actually, on these they could probably do with a little bit of polish. Kind of hard to do, but you know, just for a couple of minutes of scrubbing, get the front and the back done, just look a little bit sharper, boring, boring camera work stuff, not very interesting but it's all, it's all good stuff to keep it nice and freshened up, so it's, the aim is to make it play better but it might as well look a little bit nicer when you get it back as well. So you can sort of improve them a bit. I'll go off, do this off camera because it is a bit dreary. And we're going to make those work with this. And we're going to put in, I'm going to borrow some of the grub screws from here, although I've got tons more elsewhere, but I'm, I can't see myself using this short little thing anyway. So we'll borrow a few from here and there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that and I'm going to come back to you when I've done that and I'm going to put the neck back on and then I'll show you me putting the bridge back on and stringing it up so we can get ready to check that this works first of all, which it should do. Um, it has got the right height just about. I should keep the springs above the body of the guitar. Um, and we'll get this in place and put the strings on and then go into the 
set the setup process which is, involves the fret leveling. So see you in a minute. Okay, back again. Now just quickly to summarize, um, I was able to drill out, uh, not drill out, tap out, is that the right word? Yeah, tap out the uh, tremolo thread to a new thread, which, on your original bridge by the way, which now works with this nice vintage and aged looking thing. Cool, so that works, that's great. We'll use that later, or we'll need that later for setting the <coughs> tremolo position. So I've got a few little things I want to do before we get any further into it. I want to just, oh, I should have kept the, kept the arm in there. I want to just make sure this is down where I want it, in the right position. So I'm going to sort of feel the, oh, I've made it possible. Actually, you know what, it's okay. It doesn't need it for this bit, but I'll need to just make sure, remind me to do it later. <laughs> right, so what have we done? Well, replaced <coughs> your bridge with a new thread cut into there to take the arm. Done that. Put some old strings on. Now this is probably a tens gauge, 10 gauge set, which doesn't matter for this part of the setup, but uh, it'll matter. I'll need to be conscious that it might need a tweak afterwards. So <clears throat> what I'm going to what I'm going to do in the setup part here is I'm going to use setting the guitar up the way we want it, as close as we can get. Bearing in mind, it's probably a 10 set of old strings here. We're going to set it up as close as I can get it. And the reason I'm setting it up now is so I can level the frets with that setup in place. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get across the board my desired height, uh, string height. So just looking here, it's actually I've actually got it pretty much where I want it, <clears throat> apart from a little bit of adjustment here. Now I go on that I set up, I work from 1.2 on the high E, 1.2 millimeters on the last fret, all the way up to 1.5 on the um, low E. <clears throat> so it's a gradient between them. Um, and that's my ideal target action. And it's very low and plays really nicely. On this kind of guitar with this sort of neck, it's it should be pretty easy to get to. Um, some vintage guitars with uh, a smaller radius on the neck, which means a sort of tighter curve on the neck rather than the flatter one like this. Um, on those guitars, it can be quite difficult uh, to get a very low action and preserve all the bends. So on the, on the vintage guitars, vintage radii, like a, a 7.25, Vintage Strat or Telecaster, or some other guitars. Um, with such a tight curved radius, come on, give me an A. This tune is a bit lame. Okay, there's my, there's my um, action at this end set. <clears throat> now currently, um, I'm going to, hmm, let's do something else for a minute. What I'm going to do for the time being, before I do the setup, I'm going to pull in this tremolo claw. Now what I'm doing is I'm adding pressure to the string, so it's going to go make all the strings go sharp at the moment. But I'm doing this because I want to do all this setup work with the tremolo effectively. How difficult it is to get a screwdriver in there locked in place. I want it flat on the deck, <clears throat> which it currently isn't going. So let me just slack these a bit more and give myself some pull. It may be, it may be because, I think it is actually because I need to do this business with the front end of the tremolo. That's false economy. Let me just re revisit this. So I'm going to go back to couple of steps in the process. Just need to be able to pull these out of the way so I can tighten this up. So I need to feel where this is gonna pull forward. So I shall go back to this. Not a good idea to do this particularly with the strings in because you've got them in the way basically. So 
So I'm looking for the point at which it pulls down. And it's kind of... Mm. Mm. Okay, let's just do something else. I'm going to go backwards on this one and let this relieve the pressure on here. Still the other way around, but never mind. <coughs> okay, <coughs> excuse me. Right, like I said, it would have been far better with the strings off. What I'm looking for is, I don't want it down there, but I want it to start pulling the plate forward. Farther enough out to allow the, the uh, bridge to sit flat. Right, there it is. Sit flat bridge. Sit flat, sit flat, sit flat. Eyeball that. Right, now with that sitting flat, I want to lock it down. Which shall they will then do. <clears throat> then I'll tune back up. Now this has got three springs in the back, so it's quite a lot of pull. So we won't have to go all the way in with the claw screws to get this to... Hold the, that's what I want. I want it flat on the deck and it can move but it's not going to because the pressure is so great. Now I'm going to tune back up and get my useless little tuner to work. If it so desperately needs a new battery, it could sound funny. So you can't tell what note anything is. slack the strings off and redo them up you end up with a bit of slack in the system again. This is such a crap tuner, oh my goodness. do for the purposes of this job. Okay, <clears throat> so in terms of doing the setup, we want to get a couple of things sorted out. We want the tremolo flat on the deck as much as close as possible, which is it is at the moment. I've achieved that by tightening these uh, screws in here to pull the pressure on and sort of overcome the pull of the strings to leave it flat on the deck, which is how I want it for now. Um, in fact, for this purpose, I can take this off. I don't need it till later on. Um, <clears throat> so, I've gone across and I've checked the heights of the strings over the last fret. Now, I, re I use the last fret because I do, and right? lots of other people use the 12th fret. I use the last fret. I use three, three components I call the parts of the playing action. The last fret action, which is usually dictated by where these are sitting or where the whole bridge is sitting. The curvature in the neck, the neck relief, and the first fret action. Those three things. <coughs> 
are what concern me. And the thing you have to notice is that they're all interrelated, so you adjust one and the others will change. Now that might sound like a riddle, in other words, how do you do anything if it's always changing all the time? You just need to know that they interrelate and you end up, and I'll show you how you end up where you want. So the first thing is if I'm confident or happy I've got my last fret action here, um, which I've just measured, what I'll do now is I'll hold the last fret, hold the E string down on the last fret and the first fret, and I will check the amount of gap approximately in the halfway position, so around about the eighth fret, I think it is. Now that looks to me at about 0.25, that's fine within the limits I, I'm comfortable with. Um, it, again, lots of myths around this. Have it wherever you like. Like I said at the beginning, if you have lots of it, it might suit your playing style, but you will have certain uh, consequences. One is that if the neck is very curved in this direction, you'll find that it may be light action or low action down here and here, but you might find that it suddenly feels higher in the middle. And you won't be able to describe it exactly, but it will just feel different. If you have a flat neck, too flat, i.e. no gap at all, so when you press this one and this one down, there is no room for the string, it's already on the fret here, then you may well find that you get lots of string slap. Now this, you, you can hit it quite hard before it really slaps. But most mostly you can play this with without string slap. Uh, if you go the opposite way and the neck is humped like that, like I say, the string will sit in the middle before you do anything and you won't be able to play notes down here at all. Anyway, that's that's okay. That's okay, that's okay. And now the third part of my formula is what is the first fret action. Now I tend to measure this only because I have a, what was that? I have a kind of guide uh, height that I aim for. And I aim for 0.3 over the first fret. Now you might get a close look at this if I can reach in with this device. Um, so I measure it and basically if you can hear the, I've got 0.3 selected here on the feeler gauge. Now that's, um, they're all just probably just slightly So that's all slightly under. So that's a little bit, if anything, just a tad low. The problem is that's fine because actually that will play really well. So I'm I'm not really inclined to knock that nut out um, because the uh, there's no uneven heights. They're all about the right height. Um, the only thing that will concern me is if the height's right and it makes it nice and easy to play down here, which it is. Then all I'm next concerned about is whether the string moves to and fro inside those slots cleanly and I can always widen those a little bit with either the nut files or if necessary I can use sandpaper. So that's my only main concern now. Had they not been the right height I would have probably custom built a nut for this. Um, but it's not necessary. So I've got the three components of the action I want. I've got a very low first uh, last fret action. I've got about 0.25 to 0.2 millimeters of relief, which I know from experience, but you could measure it with the same gauge. Obviously, it's difficult to measure it with both hands in use. So what you do is you use a capo there, hold that one down there, and slide the feeler gauge in there until you've got about right. It's quite hard to do, but you, you you'll get it. And if you if you I'm used to dealing with 0.3 millimeters of height all the time over here, and I can tell what that is in relation to that. So. <clears throat> So those are the three components sorted out. Now the question is, how does it play at this time? So we've we've quite significantly lowered the action from when it came to me. I'm looking in my pocket for a spectrum, which I can't immediately find. Um, and here's one. Here's one in my pile of junk over here, in amongst all the sharp blades. I'm trying not to cut myself. So it's really low. Feels low question is, do all the notes play? And that's the first test. Okay. A little bit dead here.
cluster of high frets somewhere around here, I think. Okay, I know enough. So that's told me. Oh, I need one more thing. But that has that's told me that there is a cluster of high frets around about here that we need to take care of. The good thing about that is it doesn't need an awful lot. It's very mild compared to what I've done before, and from experience, I know it's mild. Um, so at the moment, plays. You could put um, you could put new um, new strings on, put all the hardware back in. Be quite good to play. Uh, it's getting a little bit choked out of there, but not too bad, but a little bit. But the nice thing about doing this precision fret leveling that we're about to do is that we can cl we can clear that up quite a bit. The other thing that allow us to do is probably take care of some of the uh, little grooves down here, or the little dents that are in there. We can tidy those up too, but not we're not going after that on its own sake. I don't want to lose fret metal for a, in a, a cosmetic problem that isn't going to interfere with how it plays. Now, one thing I haven't checked is what happens when I bend. So at that chosen action on this configuration, these frets are choking out here and it's a fret around here, 11 or 12. They're all, all around here, just sort of zizzing, but that one's choking out properly. So actually it's the 11th fret, um, somewhere around the middle of it. So what I'm expecting to see when, when we start doing the levelling, and I'll see if you can, you may not be able to see it, I don't think I can zoom in that close, but the, the playing of it in this configuration has shown me that the 11th fret is a problem around about here, but there's a whole cluster of frets around about here that are going to need just lowering. Now the amounts we're talking about are absolutely tiny. Um, some people try and go at it with a single, uh, you know, like a, ru a rubber block or sandpaper and they go right, the, the 11th fret is a bit high there and they sort of work at it and go, has that cleared it? Nah, do a bit more. The problem with doing that is that you can create more problems than you solve because before you know it you may have created a low spot here which then makes this fret high rel relative to that one. And it's a really tricky thing. Now the great thing about doing this way, setting a guitar up this way, my experience is, um, remember right back at the beginning I said that most guitars, uh, the action on them is kind of dictated by the condition of the underlying frets. So you'll get most of your guitars as low as you, somebody will have set them already as low as you can get before the buzzing starts. But that's it and you play with it and now you live with it after that, right? This method, we ignore whether it plays or not. We know it doesn't. It's choking out there and there's some buzzy stuff there. That doesn't matter. What we've done is we've set the action how I want it in the final washout, right? This is what I want it to feel like. Now I know it doesn't play properly. So having set it the way I like the end feel of it for you, um, that's my target. Now all we're going to do is make the frets comply with that. So we're going to we're going to kick the frets into submission with the fret leveling method. And that's why it, that's why I like about it and why it's different from normal guitars or guitars that you just inherit because playing action is dictated by the frets. We're dictating, we're, we're choosing the playing action and telling the frets what to do. So that's the difference. Um, now th what's also quite different about this method is I'm going to do it with the strings on and out will come this old friend of ours, this truss rod. And it's just a method that's really elegant and you can pick up the used truss rod by getting a, a guitar off your friend that's going in the bin and pulling the truss rod out of the neck. Um, you can do. You can put some double-sided sticky tape on it. Put some uh, 400 grit sandpaper on, like I've done on this thing here, on the flat edge of the bar. It has to have a rod and a bar, like I showed you earlier. You can put the sandpaper on the the bar edge, and then all, all I'm going to do is using these three little brass dome bolts, which are actually the same, all the same size. They have to stick up. Have to kind of rest on the fretboard and stick up above the uh, surface. Now, what I'm going to do. Is I'm going to 
going to use this left hand one as an anchor point and I'm just going to put down the flat bar and see if it's the same if it's touching all three. Now if it's not touching all three, and in this case it's not it's touching the two end ones but not the middle one, that means that the neck is curved, uh, more curved than the bar because it's missing the middle one. So what I do is then I tighten the bar which curves it a little tiny bit and this is a lot by experience and feel. And I, I still aren't, I'm still not touching the middle one so now what I do is I curve this tiny bit by tiny bit until it touches all three at once which is now doing and I can see that because it's moving the middle one. If it's touching the middle one first and then bending down at this end I can feel it and see it and I'll counter that but this is pretty much now touching all three simultaneously. Now that means even though it's high, hard to even see it, I've now curved this, this call it a fret levelling file if you like, I've now curved it so it matches perfectly the curve in this neck. And you might be you know, getting your head a bit stuck now thinking how would he, how could he use a curved thing to level frets on a curve? Well you can, as long as your tool is curved. It, the frets, as far as they're concerned, think we're working with a, a flat line. Okay. Now what I'm going to do to make this job easier is you could just go ahead and level now but to make the job easier I'm going to put on marker pen. I was about to forget to do that but this is a useful place to be reminded. So I mark permanent marker pen. I'm careful to miss the rosewood because it can be a bit hard to get off. Um, I mark the frets as far as I can all the way along them. Um, I have to do a few goes at this. It's easier to do this obviously with the, the strings off um, but I'm just gonna do the best I can. It actually doesn't matter if the strings get pen on them right now either so that's not really a problem. So I'm gonna mark all these threads and this will give me a very clear indicator of what's cutting where. Now the 400 grit sandpaper that I'm using um, will level the tiny differences that we've got to even out here but it won't cut so quickly that you you'll immediately do any kind of major metal removal. So if you ever want to have a go at this, you and you felt nervous about it, you could use this method. But you could go, you could start with 800 grit if you felt twice as worried as I am feeling right now. So you could use 800, or if you wanted to be just a little bit careful, you could use 600. Or if you felt you understood it and you just didn't mind having a try on some guitar you didn't really care much for, you could start with the uh, the six uh, the 400 I'm currently using here and it removes metal very carefully and very slowly so like I say it'll take a while before you ruin your guitar right so having set this to match that which we've already done I now put this on here and I'm going to just kind of guide it up and down um, I'm just I'm really only prevent preventing it from falling off the edge um, I'm hardly pressing down I'm just letting it kind of go up and down now, Remember I said that the two curves should pretty much match each other um, and what will get in the way of that will be any particular high frets that will start to show themselves. Now I didn't realise it but we've got one showing up there pretty quickly. That's a really high fret. So if, uh, you might not be able to see. Sorry about the noise. If I pick you along here, not cutting, hardly, a bit, quite a lot, a bit less, hardly, hardly, not. So this this is kind of low. That's just cutting a little bit. That's hardly, hardly, uh, hardly. Now we expect that one to cut more in the middle because I think number eleven. Sorry, that one's going to cut more in the middle. I think a bit, a bit less, quite a bit, quite a bit. So some of these are a little high too. That one's particularly high. I'm watching that one. So you can see that the first few goes with the file <coughs> give me quite a good indicator of what's going on. Um, and then the nice thing about this method, which you can't do with the other method that people tend to use where they, they take the neck off or they take all the strings off and they flatten the neck and they use a beam, a flat beam to do it. What you can't do with that method, and you can with this, is you, here you can put the string straight back on and listen out with your ears and your, feel with your fingers the difference. Almost perfect. I'm just going to do a tiny bit more, again from experience and hearing how one of those notes played, sounded <coughs> and how it felt. I'm now just going to just gently wiggle this up and down. So if you think about it, what I'm levelling here is what you might call the E track. It's the, it's the track that the E string works in, the top E. 
So I call it the E-Track and obviously once I've leveled the E-Track and I'm happy with that I'll, I will go over to the B-Track and so on. How clean does that sound? Now if you were to rewind this and go back to that first playthrough you'd hear the difference between that set of notes there and what we had a couple of minutes ago which is great. So I'm happy with the E-Track. Now I'm going to place the little dome nuts in the same positions where I did before but I'm just going to recheck my calibration to make sure nothing has moved in the time I've been doing it because actually it can, as you're handling it, you can put on the tiniest amount of pressure which does it up a little bit, bit or undoes it a little bit. So I want to make sure it's back on track. It had tightened up a little bit. So I'm, I'm using the same spot to calibrate for the B track because I can't calibrate this side of the E string, there's nothing there, so I can't actually put the little nuts down there. So now I'm going to work on the B track. Now straight away the marker pen's gone into the little ruts here where the frets are worn, so you can see what's remaining, how much of the rut is remaining as you fret level because it, it's still got the black marker in where everything else is starting to shine up where the papers, the 400 grit paper is cutting at it. <clears throat> so again, I'm thinking about where the B string goes and I'm making sure I cover that B track pretty well. And we know that as we go further into it, further into this, the, um, uh, as we go further into it, the fret, frets are going to need a bit more levelling across here because we heard it buzzing quite a bit. One of the things I'm not noticing, I, I, my prediction would have been that the 11th fret um, was going to be high, but what I'm noticing is it isn't high, but the 10th fret is low. And I think it's quite an interesting little thing to observe there because it, that, that initial playing, when we bent the notes, remember that choked off there on the 11th fret, there's the 12th. Um, that indicated this was high, but it's not cutting like it's high. That's cutting like it's high, quite correctly. These two here, like these three are cutting like they're high. This one here isn't cutting at all like it's high. It's just kind of standard, just trimming off the tiny little bits. But this one here is not cutting at all, so that's low, and it's one low one out of all of these. It's the only one that isn't cutting at all. And it's that one there that's making this one appear high. And it's a good indicator that it's the lowest fret in your load of um, frets that dictates what is possible. So you, you're kind of, in fret levelling, you're governed by the lowest one. You can hear it there. That low fret is making number 11 appear high. And it's still choking out slightly. <clears throat> now, there's, there's quite a an interesting challenge now because we either keep going to kind of bottom it out so that that low fret oh, sorry well, I'm on the wrong I'm on the wrong I'm in the wrong groove aren't I um, yeah we have to we have to kind of be careful that we um, if, if we go if we try and bottom out the low one we're bringing everything down to work with that lowest fret. Now sometimes it's just not so deep that it's worth doing that and then you'll get those notes freed up. It can be occasions when that fret is so low for some reason, um, and I often can't figure out why, but occasionally it can, it can be so low that you really have to stop and reconsider whether you're going to wear all the other ones down in order to try and bring that one back into play or whether it's better to pull that one out and shove a new piece of fret wire in. Um, in this case I think it's worth just sticking with it. The alternative is if you don't want to replace the fret and you don't want to you're still getting a tiny bit of choke on those big bends what you can do is you can just raise the action a tiny little bit and that will kind of rescue it back for you. Um, without hardly affecting you wouldn't really notice the difference so the tiniest action change can make the biggest difference to um, freeing up a, a choked bend. So anyway, so now I'm doing the G track and I'm kind of, at this point I'm fully expecting to see this ninth, ninth fret 
sorry, 10th fret is not cutting at all, so it is a low fret problem. And it's so strange to try and figure out what leads a fret 1 out of 21 or whatever, 22, oh, 21, 22. What leads one to be lower than the others? Now they all play okay. Just about. Yeah. Only just. Now the way we way we may have to go with this is to, to kind of row backwards a bit from our what's currently a very low action anyway, it's the lowest possible action you would get. But ideally that would be my target start point. So if we kind of go a little tiny bit up from that, acknowledging the, the low fret issue is going to stop us getting it where we really want it. We're almost freed up. And so what I can do is I may just I'll recalibrate G and I'll do the G track and I'll just do a little bit more on G and let it sit with that and I think we'll be fine and you, you would hardly notice the difference in height. I can because I know it's moved a tiny bit away from the ideal target one millimeters. With a, with a nice flat radius like this, had that fret not been unusually low for some strange reason, we'll never know, may have been banged in harder or pressed in harder. I've done it myself sometimes so it is completely possible to do that. You put more effort into pressing one down than the others and before you know it you've got one slightly lower fret which creates problems but um, had it not been for that slightly lower fret we could have had that one millimeter playing action on the top E which is my usual target on a guitar like this. But there we go. I think we're always going to get that unless we go a fraction higher with this which I will do for the time being, but is that tenth fret? Sorry, ninth fret. No, the tenth one that's low makes the eleven high, relatively. Okay, that's cleared it enough for now. I can live with that. Still a very low action. Um, it's just, it's just annoying me because we could have got that a little bit more just have to accept it. It's just what comes with it. Now this, the um, curvature of the neck changes across, sometimes the relief in the neck changes a tiny little bit as you go across the neck. It's not the same all the way across. It can be, but often it's not the same. So now we, we've got a little bit extra curvature on. I mean, that's a tiny bit too much, if I'm honest. You'd be hard pushed to even see the changes I'm doing here. They're just feelable more than anything. That's almost too much the other way. It's almost like breathing on it and it changes. There you go. So now we're doing the A track. Now as far as the whether or not the nut slots, that's the other consideration remember, whether the nut slots were good enough to not require, you know, do we need to do any more work for those for our perfect tuning stability? Well from this point onwards I'll be listening out, whenever I put strings in here and tune, I'm listening out for any pings, and pings are a good, a really good clear indicator of whether um, whether the, the strings are catching in the slots, and if they are catching in the slots they'll, they'll kind of just hold up a little bit, there's enough friction there. What it does is it causes, the friction is just enough to change, make an, a difference between the tension on this side and the tension on that side. And what will happen is the minute you bend a note, you'll press enough force into it just to re readjust that tension and balance it out or pull it the opposite way and the, the guitar will appear to detune. Same as if there's an imbalance of tension between these two sides because it's caught, it's held the string back. Cranking on the tremolo will put enough pressure to overcome that stickiness. It'll pull the thing through, change the, the, the tension either side again, maybe equalize it, maybe pull it more the other way and you'll get that detuning again. So it's critical that these are not, um, they're not there's, there's as little friction as possible in those. A little bit there, but again it's around this, it's around this low tenth fret. So really that's turning out to be the biggest challenge 
on, on the action of this guitar is a, is a badly seated fret. And quite often you'll be used to encountering badly seated frets that are high because they haven't been hammered in correctly or, or pressed in correctly. It's, it's not so common that you end up with a badly seated fret because it's too far in, but it, it's proof here that it is absolutely possible. And that's what it does, it makes you, it makes, makes the next fret too high by quite a margin. So again, it's that sort of thing of having that experience to know that that's what could be going on. And it's also having enough experience to know whether you can tweak your action enough to get around it with fret levelling or whether it's so bad that you're going to have to replace the fret. So now we're doing the A. And again, I'm seeing it missing the, uh, the 11th fret. So that's such a pain. <laughs> we've barely got anywhere near touching it the whole time. But let's get as close as we can. Doesn't, yeah, it's just there, it doesn't like it. Calibrate it once more and give it a little bit more of a, a hitting on that. A, yeah, get it in the right place. Got magnets everywhere to keep things in place so I don't lose them. Mostly. Okay, that's good. It's still in shape. Do a bit more on the A, and then we'll move to the E. This will be quite a bit lower than it was anyway, um, so you'll, you'll definitely feel the improvement. Um, and the main thing is, is to get it, like I said, my priorities are, first of all, staying, playing and staying in tune. Um, for you, Xander, that's, from my experience, that's the most important thing. If you get this guitar and it won't stay in tune, you'll, you'll, um, you, you, may, you know, you may find yourself just giving up on it or, or avoiding it. So, I think staying... Staying and playing in tune is the most important thing. The next one is how it feels and whether it hurts your fingers and whether it's easy to play and that's the, the top two priorities that I'm aiming to do on this. And then after that comes how do the pickups sound which we are going to upgrade for you. And then after that comes how does it look. Right, right down on the list of important things. And it's not that it's not important what it looks like but if all the other things are wrong, tuning, stability, the playing action, the pickup tone, if those things are wrong, especially the first two, it doesn't matter how good it looks, you're, you're going to leave it in its case. You're not going to be feel motivated to get it down off the peg, get it out of the case and play it. So that's my kind of goal is always to get those first two really taken care of. And then if we can do the third one, make it sound good, make sure the pickups sound as good as they can for, for the money you've got, then great. Um, yeah, we've got we've got a bunch of frets here that are way too low. They've been hammered in too hard down here. Um, yeah, so get you know if we can make the pickup sound good, we'll do that too, which is great. It is what it is. We can make it as shiny as possible, clean everything, and then the last thing on the list is the brand. And Yamaha is pretty good, but there you go. Yamaha is pretty good, but I've seen plenty of um, expensive Gibsons which had the big name on the headstock, but they were unplayable, um, despite having cost somebody £1,500 to buy, which is outrageous. I found out quite early on. Get there. Ping, did you hear that? E. The E, I'm going to note it down so I don't forget, there's a ping on the high E and that's something I've got to keep an eye out and make sure I get the files in and just widen it so we don't get any tuning instability. Yeah, I've played, played Gibsons um, that might have cost 1500 quid or something straight off the peg of the shop and they were unplayable and the truth is the shop wasn't going to be doing any of this work to it. The shop was going to sell it like that and the, when I asked them about it the owners of the shop said 
really well set up at Gibson. It's Gibson, don't you know? And so they were being fooled by, by the opposite priority. You know, they were selling to people who were obsessed with the brand first, um, the look of the thing second, tone or the brand and make and tone of the pickups third, um, playability clearly fourth, and last on the list was whether it would stay in tune or not, because none of them would, and, and it's quite common knowledge. And the reason they don't stay in tune was because of the, the nuts were really badly cut, amongst other things. Uh, they've started to take care of that now with a, a brass adjustable, titanium adjustable nuts, which is a brilliant idea, and they should have done it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but they didn't. Anyway, look, the setup, biggest part of it, is done. What I've done is I have leveled the frets with the guitar under the kind of condition it's going to be in when we restring it with new strings. So I can let these strings go, let, take them off now, and they will, the neck will slacken off. We can then go away and order the pickups, get those installed when they come. Put this all back together again and pretty much put uh, clean the fingerboard, put some new strings on and we'll be away. There are a couple of little steps I've got to do on this. Having leveled the frets, um, I want to reprofile them or crown them, you may have heard people talking about. When you level the frets you put some flat, flat uh, you, you create a flat spot on top of them which is obvious when you think about it, you're taking off the high peaks and you, naturally some of them more than others you can see when, you, when you're looking close up you'll see there's flatter frets than others. <coughs> Those represent the higher ones. The, uh, the across the lower ones that weren't touched at all haven't changed shape because they haven't been touched. But the aim now is to use a tool called a reprofiling or a crowning tool to turn these flat ones back into kind of arch shaped ones because you need you need a, a sort of yeah a shape of an arch for the string to sit right on the top of the hill. Um, if you leave it flat, the string sits across the flat spot, and it kind of launches off the front edge of the fret rather than the middle, right in the centre at the top. And so that's why the simple reason why we recrown them is to. Um, I think I'm just going to cut these off. They've done enough service. Oh, I don't know actually. Another one. Now I'm going to do a different guitar next, so that's fine. Um, yeah, so so if you if you have flat frets, the what's what I call the intonation point moves from dead centre of the fret, which is where it should be. It moves forwards to the front edge, well this way towards the front edge of the flat spot. And if you've done a fair bit of fret working, that can be a millimetres difference. And funnily enough, that's enough to slightly change the intonation, which means that your notes as you play them in different places on the guitar won't quite be in tune with where you started off with. Um, and that can be that can be a bit annoying when you're playing on your own, um, but it actually can be a complete sort of disaster when you're playing with other people because you run the risk of constantly being slightly out of tune with everyone. And it's never a huge deal, but it's, all, it's enough to kind of just make what feels like a bad din. I should know, I've done it enough times. So I'm marking off the flattened frets, or all of the frets, and I'm going to use a concave file which will help me. Basically, if you think of the curved or the arch shaped fret from the side, I've now put a flat top on it. And so this next file I'm going to use is going to sort of take the shoulders off that and bring, um, bring it down to a bring it into an arch shape, but it's going to do that without um, taking any height off the fret. And that's the really important thing, because we've just spent all that time and precision levelling the fret, so they're all level relative to each other, apart from those little critters up there, which is still low. And so this fret now takes the kind of sticking out shoulders of the flat spot, and it kind of files them inwards until they, re they return to being a kind of arch shape. And that, that brings the centre point, or the, the intonation point of the string, back to the centre of the fret, which is where it belongs. Now, the reason I use the marker is because I can use this file, I can, if I, I can aim to leave a little strip of black marker pen down the centre of the fret, because I'm only really cutting off the shoulders of the fret. Um, and so long as I finish that job and I leave this little black line on top, a very, very thin line on top of the fret, what I know is I haven't taken it down in height any further because I've not touched the very top of it. So I'm basically keeping 
that relative level that we just spent loads of time achieving. And so the ones you'll see, kind of notice the ones that are most of the materials come off, i.e. the ones that were flatter, uh, will take a bit longer than everything else. The ones I haven't touched at all, almost one swipe and will be leveled out. Now these are flattened on the end in both cases, so I have to do a bit more on the end to uh, flatten them out. No, round them off I should say. That one, hardly anything. Bit at the end here, nowhere else, don't think. And this one, a little bit at the far end as well, not much else. This one, not much. This one, well, if I'm seeing any to do on this one at all, it's because it's been flattened before somewhere. So that tells me that the reason it's low is it may have been, it may literally have been spot flattened. Remember I said that some people like to try and iron out a problem by just doing one fret in one place. That has been flattened before, but we also know it's too low. So it suggests to me that may have been over flattened. And it's, you remember I said that doing it that way can create problems. Well, I think the thing we just experienced with not being able to level everything out because of the one low fret is the result of somebody trying to cure a particular high fret and in doing so has taken it down lower than everything else. So it's a bit like being a forensic, um, what is it? what's that program? Oh, you know the one. I was going to say touch of frost, but that was years ago. You know, the, the mortuary ones where they all do the forensic stuff. Anyway, that's kind of what it's like. You're doing lots of trying to work out what happened by looking at the telltale marks on here. So it's definitely a forensic, it's kind of pathology, guitar pathology. But you know, the frets bear, bear the marks of everything that's happened to them, so they do tell quite a good story. But I would say that's what's happened. Sometimes what, what I find is, I've found on a couple of guitars actually, where they've taken a knock, they've fallen forward quite often, they'll fall over on their front and it will drive the strings where it hits a table edge or something or a chair, it drives the strings into the frets and sometimes people will get a little cluster of dents like chips or nicks and what they'll do is they'll use that kind of rubbing it out and trying to remove the marks from those frets only and you suddenly get a cluster of frets in one patch, two or three, that are suddenly low and they're lower than they could possibly be by just being pressed in a little bit carelessly. Um, and then you can, you can on, on those guitars, I found little signs elsewhere, little marks where you can see the impact of the thing as the string has kind of gone across the frets in a line, and you can see maybe other marks on the body where it's, it's fallen over. So it's quite interesting to be a sleuth and track it back. Okay, so that's now done. That's the fret re-crowned or reprofiled, reshaping it so it works better but without lowering its height. Now what I'm doing now is I'm just going to use this naphtha to take off the bulk of the dust and as much of the marker pen as I can. Obviously that's not the end of this, we're going to want to sand all of these frets out now. Um, until they're a uh, kind of shine. And they'll do that with loads of different grades of sandpaper and some micro mesh. And it'll take about half an hour of hard work. But um, what I'll do before that is I'll just clean, use the same stuff to clean the fingerboard. At the same time, wiping any of the last remnants of marker pen off. But this is taking uh, the, the finger grease off there from however many years you've played it already. Don't worry, I'm not calling you grubby. We all, we all leave grime on the, on the fretboard. In fact what, make, what makes the rosewood look so good is our finger oils and dead skin. So you, if you were into kind of Jurassic Park stuff you could probably clone a few people from a good old 20 year old guitar. You could clone all its owners from the DNA. Except that's why I like to clean it. Clean rather than clone, that's what I say. And even if it's your own goo, I think it's nicer to get it back with some of that removed. So you can see it's a bit 
It's a bit of effort to do, but it's worth it. It'll feel like a new guitar when the frets are now polished up next. Okay, so that's the next stage. Um, there's really only a couple more stages now. We're going to sand out all the leveling marks, which will be very tiny because it's a 400 grit paper we use, but it's still there. The marks are still there. So we're going to um, we're going to sand those out with a series of papers that get finer and finer, so we can eventually come to a shine. Uh, and then when we've done that. Let's just we'll pause until we've got the pickups and then we'll put the pickups in load the connect up the pick guard again um, and then the final bit will be to restring the new strings stretch them all out chase out any final pings and tuning instability caused by uh, any slight gripping of, of the string through the nut slots and we'll get rid of we'll sort all that out stretch the strings out fully and then do the intonation uh, on the guitar to make sure make sure that it's um, intonated correctly. The, each string is the right length for the guitar. They all have different lengths. And then when that's done, the sort of final bit of this will be to set up the tremolo in a floating configuration. So it has both downward motion and backward motion, so you can bend the notes up as well to a, a fixed amount. And you know you may kind of spend. A, a few months with it and decide that tremolo isn't your thing but it's good to have it to begin with or you know early days when you're playing so you can really decide whether you like the effect it gives you rather than never having it on board because nobody's been able to make it play and stay in tune okay so this is uh, this is going to be a, a boring section where I spend quite some time just masking off and then I have to cut a load of little strips that are all smaller as we go down there so this will go on for a while and it will be very boring. So for my sanity I'm going to go off camera, listen to the radio for a while um, and I'll come back on. Actually I won't even come back on until maybe a couple of days from now when I've got the new pickups. But I'll order them tonight. Well actually I'll invoice your dad tonight and then hopefully I can get them ordered tomorrow. Um, and hopefully they'll be here by midweek. Um, and then I'll be able to fit them latest next weekend with the idea that I can get this back to you before Christmas. But you won't see this video until well after that. So happy Christmas and I hope you enjoyed playing your guitar as much as I, I did setting it up for you. Okay. I had my first guitar when I was, I think I was six and um, I got... I think it was a classical guitar, or it might have been like a classical Spanish classical style guitar, but I think somebody might have put metal strings on it, and it was. And I know it was enough to get me interested, um, but it was. It was pretty horrible and hard to play, and I think I gave it away or sold it to somebody, or even at the age of six, or actually I had to give it away because we had to move house and couldn't take it. Um, but and then. I don't think I had a guitar until until I was 15 and then I had a terrible cheap nasty thing that I bought from a friend's catalogue. I'll tell you, you have to ask your dad because he might remember what catalogues were all about. Anyway, I'm going to go. Have a great weekend. I'll see you in the middle of next week when I get the pickups back in and we'll fill these holes and um, I might find some larger scale pots to replace these but they're, they're okay. It's a, it's a 500k one for the volume um, and a 250k one for the tone which is normally on a strat with this type of thing you would have both 250k's because it's all single cores but the, the reason they're different is because it's it's got a humbucker and two singles and the humbuckers tend to go with 500k anyway see you soon Xander have a good weekend catch you later quick pause halfway through the sanding the frets process um, I just wanted to remember to show you or I wanted to show you the truss rod cover so you need a little Phillips screwdriver to uh, get it out and probably a little spiky thing to lift it out with so the little block comes out there <laughs> there's the hole that the screw goes into but your truss rod lives in there 
and then you want to adjust it with, depends how big it is, uh, a hex key that looks like that. Um, as you're looking at it clockwise to tighten it up, which will flatten it out and eventually make it go like that. Uh, if it's too flat, you want to slacken by going anti-clockwise, which will release the tension on the truss rod and allow the um, strings to pull some more curvature in, into the neck if they can. Sometimes your truss rod's old and stiff and it won't work at all and it doesn't make any difference. But most of the time you'll see it makes that difference. So as it is, it's set where I want it right now. But like I said earlier on, don't be afraid to give it a go and see what it does. It's much more important that you, you see what it does. This is always annoying. Where is the damn thing? It's near the end. Yeah, much more important, in my opinion, that you get to see what it does um, for yourself rather than just take somebody's word for it or read in the forums. So this is a, I think this is a 5mm hex key, let's just check what well, they call it, an M5, probably. Uh, not that way, that way. Yeah, M5 or 5mm hex key. Pretty standard, in you know, every set you'll get one of those, so that's how you do it. Anyway, I'm halfway through polishing out your frets. As you can see, everything's protected off to make sure they're nice and shiny now, but now I'm moving on to the... Um, micro mesh set and I'm going to go over all of those with this right the way up to 12,000 grit the last one in the set. All right so I'll stay, spare you the boredom see you next week when the uh, pickups are in. Bye. I don't know what the word is pride in not creating any more piles of solder but I'm not too bothered about what something looks like underneath the hood. I, I care that this thing comes together and does its job. So I've got two separate clumps of earth or ground wires to connect up here. So I'm going to make two separate lumps of solder because that will just make it easier so one won't pop off while I'm trying to heat the other one up and so forth. Okay, so let's just go back for a second to our arrangement. We know these are now going to sit in here and nice and tidy. We can fold them down a bit. May I could have maybe left a bit more wire but hey, now this one it's going to come across here and we're going to just tack it onto the side of there and go under these and make it a little bit tidier. Get this red one out of the way so nothing gets overheated. And to join these up I'm going to use a mixture of these pliers to persuade it to stay in one place. So I use the solder to heat them together so they, their solders become part of one big lump together and then I use the pliers to press them down and hold them there while it sets. So that's your first two con um, joined, so the neck and the middle together. They don't have to be separate, it's just, the, for me it's easier to keep them separate because, like I say, when you're trying to do two separate things, if you put one on, the other one ten tends to spring up. Now, of all the, these three, you might want to, you may want to make more of an effort to preserve the length of this wire here because this might go in another guitar, another point, it might go in a different position or be further away from the control cavity. So, but you, you do have a lot of kind of wires going on here and it makes quite a big pile of stuff to deal with. So what I tend to do is I tend to try and bend this. Now I've got to remember what the shape of the cavity is. Right alongside here, there's not that much room but then it becomes more room in there. But we've got to get this thing tidied up in such a way that we can tuck it away. So I'm going to start with this, but I'm always on the doing it on the in the awareness that this little cluster of wires that I'm trying to tidy up here might just oh, might not fit. And it might actually be more of a hindrance than a help, but I'm just I'm trying to trying to stop it being completely out of the way. Now what I have done in the past is I've done something like this and then I've put that there. Could even be under here for example. Put that under there. Now that potentially could live um, in the swimming pool space 
Um, we've got room to get to our things we've got to get to there and there. Um, but we can also potentially tack this down with some tape, which is quite a cool thing. That's if there's enough room, and there should be quite a lot of room. So I'll do that right now. Let's get a little bit of Gorilla Tape for the fun of it. I'm pretty much out of Gorilla Tape, so trip to the DIY type place. So I'm just going to use a little strip or two actually to keep it in place. Threads go away. So let's, let's imagine where we want to get this. Let's put that there. Let's stick that on there and on there. In the meantime, we can cut off the excess that we don't need. Okay, and let's see if that works. It may not. And then now we've got two more things to attach. I want to just check that's firmly attached. This one is going to go to here, as we already know it is. Now this is going to want to swing around a bit, so you might have to kind of do something to persuade it, persuade it to stay there. I'm not sure what will persuade it. It's like, don't go anywhere else. Thank you. About there will do. It's very small amount of room you've got to play with, so it's about how do you how do you get a, a good um, connection, a solder connection, without tons of excess wire hanging everywhere, and without the risk of shorting off something else. But you've also got to have enough room to get back to put your earth down on there. So one thing, it's not quite right now, but if you if you sort of, it tends to help if you pull in the direction away from the lug that you intend to go so that, that you reduce the risk of the things soldering in the wrong direction. So for example, if I want these things to come away from each other, that's probably my best bet there. Maybe even further around that way. Something like that. That's a sort of clear so propping things can be really helpful. And then you can fill up the lug and get it nicely attached like that. Okay. This is a very thin wire, this uh, hot wire. So we have to be very careful. And then basically we'll come down with this last one, last earth wire which is the, the two earths from the bridge pickup and we want to get that onto the top of here and there is very little spare room so it's a tight, tight fit. Settle, get in, heat it up properly. There we go. Do it. So you can see it's it's at a stretch, right? but that's how it came. Now I could have, if, if I wanted to, I could have split this all apart, stripped it back so it pretty much went straight there and saved a lot of room. That's one way of doing it. Um, and it would have, I could have then set the amount of um, wire we needed rather than being got, um, kind of constrained by it here. But it's okay. Now uh, I have lost the little thing. Put those out of the way. So that's the that's the main fittings taken care of. Now what we've got to do is bring the guitar back, and what we're going to do is we're going to try it for fits, try and fit it in. So this has to go through this hole here, back out to the jack socket, which it actually doesn't seem to want to do, which is down there. It's quite a small hole, so it's going to snag on everything along the way. Blimey, it really is. Absolutely everything. Now, if you're not careful, continual movement of this is likely to lead to it breaking off. Now, you don't want to be constantly worrying about that. What you can do is go to tape, just a little tiny bit of masking tape, hold these things together and just 
tape off the end into a little sort of sharp point, squidge it into a point, it may help you get through a difficult tunnel. It's not very helpful. Now this one has to go through here into the cavity of the tremolo. And this one now we want to go through here, which is now much more compliant. A bit of luck will come out through that hole. So that all of this is a bit hold it, pull it, push it. There's a lot of faffing about to do. And then we line these things up and you've got to make sure the wires go through. And then you've got to get your pliers in there to hold that wire, thankfully. And then kind of check where things can fit. Now I have a feeling that right now it's not going to want to sit straight down on top of this pile of stuff. So I'm going to say rather than fight this all day long, I think we're going to need to um, cut down this. Um, maybe you might say not ideal, but if you don't have the space to fit it in, then there's no point struggling with um, miles of coiled up cable that's going to get in the way. It's much better to get your guitar working. So, so I'm going to just remove this one and remove these, and we're going to cut this back to a workable size, a workable amount of cable, which means we don't have to stack up a ton of stuff getting in the way. Okay, so let's start this again. So we come all the way back and we go, what have we got to get? We've got to get from here to there, which is about that much. And we go, sorry. And then we strip this back with enough room to work. A very light sort of cut on the plastic sheath here. We'll allow it to come off. There's a metal sheath on the outside of that. Okay, so we know that our black and our metal sheath is the um, earth. And we also know that the red is the hot, so therefore the green and the white are the joined pair for the coil split. So we'll strip that one back first. Both of those back a little bit. And then we'll join those together. Now while I'm at it, it probably makes sense to keep these out of the way. And join the green and the white um, sanity check. If you don't realize don't know, go back to this, yeah, green and white are joined. Hold them there. Join them, and then we'll put a bit of shrink tube on it as well. So that keeps them safely together. Shrink tubing. So if you're shrinking tubing, put a bit on and leave a bit dangling off the end more than you need. Um, okay, what do I do with the heat gun? There it is. and then sort of use it. It's quite difficult to use without setting fire to the wire, but you can do it if you're careful. So there's our, our pair. Um, really hot air is better than a flame gun like this. Um, also what you can do, let me find some. bigger gauge um, and put the whole of that in there too which gives you a chance to safely double back your pair out of harm's way. Of course this is a little bit frond like at the moment so let's just try and twist that into workability. Again with these extra bare wires that are ground. You don't need, you don't really want loads of bare ground wire sticking out everywhere. So 
you can also use a bit of shrink tube to sort of keep those out of harm's way as well. So this way, you can see I can just push all this back in here. Now, if I don't want to, I don't really have to do much with that, but I can give it some heat. Like I say, this is a pretty um, heavy-handed heat method. It does work, but it's um, maybe it's even lost its shrinky mojo. This stuff. Melt the entire thing. Um, yeah, that'll do. It's not brilliant, but okay. So we are going to just take a, open up a little bit of bare wire on the end of both of these. Black one. Twist together with that one. Uh, two ground wires, and then the red one into the switch. So that's basically just tidied up a ton of surplus wire. Sometimes you can get it to fit and it just works out but I don't think it's worth fighting to preserve. Okay so so this way we can just bend that one to there. I'll we'll use the solder sucker to remove the solder again. should have done. Just to keep it together sometimes, it, it can be amazingly difficult to put an untinned wire into a, a lug hole because it just sort of wants to, a little strand wants to grab hold of the side. It's like trying to put a cat in a cat box to take it to the vet. It can be a real pain. All right. so then again we have a slight problem with this wanting to, wanting to pull in one direction and not the other. We'll try and use the magic hand. Come this way, I'll do. It's trying too hard now. Okay. You always got to resist the temptation to blow on the solder if you solder. I'm always tempted to do it to make it set faster, but it's never a good thing because you make what's called a cold joint which will break and then it won't work. So, we've got a nice pile of solder here to get this sunk into. If I can get the heat into it well enough, there you go. Done. Sorry. Okay. So there's our. Just looking at this. It's a bit shaggy. This joint down here. Man. Where's it gone? My thing. My thing. It's gone somewhere. I think I hung it up. I don't like that joint there. And there's ground wires. What they've done is they've come through, they've wired it through that lug into the top of there, which is okay. Okay, also there's a bit of movement in there, so I'm going to use a special tool bequeathed to me by a friend of Relove Guitars called the Knob Puller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you sort of go down there like, I don't know if it works on this, will it work? Hey, come on. Baby, how does this work? Come on, strut knobs, it's got to work. Can't be that way because it's too. Can get under there. Don't tell me you've got to push that down from above. Tell I've never used these before. So, theoretically, that would go under there like that. But I bet you can't push that over the top. I need to bet you. Don't think we can. That would be cool, a way of doing it, but it doesn't work that way. Mm, maybe, maybe. Let's try again. So it's supposed to, it's supposed to pull up by using these little feet or a little 
edges, but there's no good if they've got little die marks on them from the factory. So it's supposed to hook under there, like that. And then technically you're supposed to be able to push this on. Of course it won't work if you can't do that. Can you do that? Yeah, maybe you can. And then you go down to there and you go like that. Huh. Well that was hard enough, wasn't it? But effective. So I'm just going to take the opportunity to do this pot up more firmly so it doesn't come undone again in your lifetimes. I ought to do the same with here, but actually that's quite firmly attached. Right. Um, I tend to try and line them up in their final positions, so 10 and 10 there. Right, let's get that out of the way. Let's get that out of the way. Okay. Put that there for a minute. Get the old axe back. Okay, so back to the same challenge. This kind of helps to know where that wire is going, so it's sort of that way and back. This one through here. Stand the old thing up. Put one through there. Grab that one. Grab that one. Okay, we're we're all right. Now I'm just gonna make sure that wire goes in there. And that wire is trying to get caught there a minute. Okay, so there's a, wow, well, that's not very long. There wasn't a lot of room on that, was there? Okay, so that's getting held up under there now. So I've just got to find out what's, what's getting in the way of that. There shouldn't be anything, the switch shouldn't be getting in the way. This piece of wire shouldn't be getting in the way. There's nothing, nothing, but, oh, I can't really see what's going on there with these glasses. So this is one of the most annoying parts of the whole thing is getting these, finding out which of these is getting in the way and holding up the thing from seating properly. Now that feels like, feels like it's got to be this wire. So I'm pressing that down. That not wanting to go flat particularly, but that's the only thing that's in the way. Mm. So basically that's got to go through that little tight gap there. Yikes. Through there. Um, there's something else getting in the way here. Okay, are these getting in the way? I think they might be. Blimey. Yeah. Yeah, so that's always the tricky bit, getting these things back on. Okay, now somewhere in here I've lost my, nearly lost my jack socket wire, which I can just about rescue. Ah. Almost too short now, but there we go. So this is where our thing's going to sit. Let's get that done up for a minute. Now I've got to do this with full awareness that this may not be. You, know, you have to always think this might not be wired correctly. So be, be prepared for um, testing it before you put it back together again. It's one of the things I learned the hard way. And I'll show you what I use to test it in a minute, which is really handy. So I've put a whole bunch of new screws in here. And I'm putting them in. Now it should, it should only need a low torque setting. You don't want to over, wire, uh, over push them, if you know what I mean. Over screw them, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Now, that's that. That's keeping that in place. So while we're at it, before we do a test, let's get this soldered up to that, and the, oops, and let's get 
a connection to an amp going to make sure that these pickups all work and in the correct order before we do anything else. So here we've got the claw with a big lump of solder on it. It's actually quite difficult to fit this earth wire to the tremolo claw, mainly because the claw itself is a cold piece of metal and it sort of acts like a heat sink and it just tries to shed the heat off the um, solder so it can be quite difficult to get it to attach the wire. Um, now this one here we have to blimey, hmm. um, I'm missing something from this guitar and I don't quite understand where it's gone and that's a jack socket uh, where did it go that's really weird I'm gonna have to do a bit of hunting because uh, it doesn't seem to be in the container it was in to begin with maybe I left it in here and I don't realize it there. Oh, it's probably in here, hidden in all this other stuff. That's not all to be thrown away. Lucky. Okay. Lucky. So I have realised that because I might have chucked that away. Okay, so we have the jack socket here which is loose. That needs tightening up now. So, let me do the same thing here. Just get this tightened up. It's actually quite difficult to hold because it's very spiky so you might need to when you tighten these up you might need a cloth or something to protect your hands as the thing turns and tries to cut into your fingers mm. enough to tighten it up okay so we've got to basically get this onto here which is not a lot of room Oof, that's, that's going to be a tough ask however before we do that we want to check that this all works before we invest time. Oh, I keep pulling bits out of this towel. This towel's had it. Um, yeah, we want to check that it works. So to do that, we've got to use a couple of these really handy, um, what do you call them, this jumper wires, test, test wires, I suppose. Uh -huh. And an amplifier, which of course isn't currently plugged in. So I have to go through all of that. Kerfuffle too. Just move everything. Bring up the amp. Find the plug-in bed. Oh, oh, oh. um, I think rechargeable batteries here is a better idea. Are you on? Yes, you are. Now, what I'm going to do to make this as simple as possible is plug that in there, dangle that there, and I'm going to use these little these little tester clips. I'm going to put one on the ground bit and do that on the barrel of this. That's the earth. And then I'm going to put a separate one on the hot bit and put it on the tip of the jack plug, which is the hot bit. And with that done, you should be able to here uh, gain effects off. Okay, neck, neck and middle, middle on its own, middle and bridge, bridge on its own. There you go, so that's all working. Tone, yep, volume, yep. Okay, so that little bit of bench testing is a way of saving yourself a lot of misery because hooking up this jack plug is going to be a little bit of a tight squeeze at the moment followed by oh no uh, please work <laughs> followed by um followed by yeah you don't want to put the time into doing that and then find you um it doesn't work and you have to take it apart and figure out what's happened so as you see it's not a lot of room here to get this thing done so the first thing i'm going to do is probably pull off this load of melted or a load of big blobs of solder here um, which I don't quite know what's attached to them but there's bits of wire that we need to pull out as well so just kind of heat it all the way through and 
see if we can pull it out. God blimey. There you go. And then same here. So it would be easier to use the our little hands, holding hands thing, grasping hands to do this, but I can't be bothered just now. So I'm just trying to empty these and clean these out and start again. Okay. Looks about right. So um, actually that's a bit, that is a bit on the grubby side down there. And it could do with a clean of some sort. Um, 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 cleaner, cleaner, content cleaner. Shoot it at the ground. really do with is a bit of um, sandpaper going through there to, to kind of clean up the electrical contact surface but this is a bit grubby this old thing um, but it clearly works so uh, just not not been used much by the looks of it things that you find along the way that need taken care of like this so I've noticed that you've got some build-up of gunge on the inside of the jack socket now you could buy another one but I'm going, I'm going to attempt to just improve that a little bit without buying another one so I'm making a, a little bit of a tube here which I hope a bit of luck will fit in there if it's too big I will remove some of the thickness of it Fold it again. Now so it's slightly abrasive as it's made of sandpaper. I've got it into roughly a tube shape. If I can get it in there now, I can let it expand, and then all I'm just going to do is pull it through and let it abrade the inner surface of here because this needs to be a metal to metal contact and it's got all this old gunge on it, then it's it's gonna to want to uh, it's gonna resist getting a good metal electrical contact. And you don't need that since electric guitars work by sending electrical signals. There you go. Spin it around. Okay, that'll improve things. Right, we've still got the difficult bit, which is attaching it. It's such a small amount of room to work with, so can we do it? We know it works, and now we can commit to putting it back together again. So the earth bit is uh, this middle bit here. Middle isn't the right word. I think I know what I mean. So I'm just going to try and get this to heat up enough to soften this so we can push this on. There we go. That's part one. We could probably just let that can attach. That isn't finished. But I'm trying to make life a little bit easier for myself here because otherwise it's going it's a very tight little solder which I'm not used to. So here is the here is the hot wire which I'm now gonna get through and do there. I'll do that fully now the hot the hot wire. This comes out of the, uh, the volume pot and comes straight out here to the jack socket here. Now it's nicely attached. And with that nicely attached, I can now, I can't even turn it around very well. What I want to do is just cut off the excess. 
there. I'd like to bend it down a little bit like that, that would be helpful. And now I can just finish the, the ground connection. So I'm heating the lug and letting the solder run. There you go, fill the gap up. Okay, that's done. So now, I can lift this up, move it around and put a couple of screws in. Now, it wants to be not touching anything, which is a hope where we, we've got it. second one in just to locate it. And there we go. Okay, that's quite a nice job. Done. Okay, so let's move this to one side. So we now have our new pickups. We'll turn off the soldering iron. Going to remove all our electrical bits and pieces. We need uh, six more of these little new screws. There we go, cut that to one side. I never, can't believe I put the um, pickups on back to front. What am I like? Anyway, once I've done this, I've got to re fret this fender neck. Um, now these are leftover bits, so I can now put these out of the way. Uh, I'll send them back, um, but I, you, may, you may want to keep them, and they might be good for sometime in the future. You might want to make a custom guitar, make your first guitar or something. So having some spare pickups around that you can use to sort of learn about how it works is a pretty good thing to have in reserve. Okay, let's keep that out of the way, throw these away, bits and pieces. Uh, actually, they're not bad little wires, keep those spare. Keep that spare. Right, next stage when I've just got these things out of the way is to restring. And then restring, and once we've restrung, stretch the strings out so that they stay in tune. And then, once that's done, we're going to um, set the tremolo, which is a really simple but very effective system. Be closed so I don't freeze. Okay, so I'll move these bits and pieces out of the way. Again, little bits of solder from the solder sucker get everywhere, so it's worth just brushing it down so you don't scratch. If you've got time, take it out and shake it outside, but if you don't, just make sure you brush it thoroughly down so the bits are gone and get your excess wires out the damn way. Okay, so we're going to go with nines on this so that you, you, you can get to play it easy, easily without hurting your fingers. Uh, um, nine gauge strings are not the lightest you can get, you can actually buy eights, um, which I believe, I think Brian May of Queen used, or still does or something, but, um, but anyway, nines are, are tend to be the sort of common, the, the popular choice um, for a lot of guitarists, uh, particularly on guitars with longer necks or longer scale lengths, because the longer the, uh, scale length, the tighter the strings have to be to bring the guitar to a certain pitch. So on a guitar like this, which has a Fender style um, scale length, you, you tend to find that nines feel good. And if you put nines on a guitar like a Les Paul or a Les Paul Copy with a shorter scale length or a PRS or something like that, then nines can feel too loose for some people. Um, a lot of people think or feel that um, tens or the thicker the strings, the bigger the gauge you go, the more 
tone and power you get out of the pickups, which probably is true. Um, but it depends on your playing style and your hand strength, really. Um, if you get, you know, as you as you get older, if you get really strong hands, then you could end up with really thick strings on, and, and um, some people even play with thirteens. Um, but mostly, it tends to most people tend to play between nine and tens. I think it's a, a very common um, range. Okay, so for restringing and doing the, the tremolo, it's an interesting little process. So we'll start off with the tremolo screwed mostly in, and I'll have my screwdriver handy for for that. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure what we want is to start with it flat on the deck with all the strings loaded. So just to make sure that I'll screw these tremolo claw screws in. That, that means the string the springs are squeezing really hard and pulling this back down onto the body of the guitar. So we'll start with that and we'll string it like that to begin with. Now having done um, having done the fret leveling we we know that the frets are level and we we nice thing about doing it that way is we can now re string this um, and the, the neck will kind of bend back into the position we had it when we did the fret leveling. And that means it'll be nice and level and we should find that we can pretty much stretch the strings out and play. Obviously we won't have the tremolo in effect just yet because we've got to set that up for its correct range of movement. Right. So I think I mentioned at the beginning that critical thing is getting your guitar to play and stay in tune and critical to that is the nut and the slack left in the strings so we're going to check all the way along that this nut is okay and it's not gripping the strings it's, it is a plastic one um, which is sometimes can give problems but if it's cut right and we we seem to be okay with it. I seem to seem to seem to work pretty well when we were doing the leveling. Um, therefore, we should, we may be able to stick with it. If, if it goes wrong and if it just will not let the strings move through um, the slots freely, and if it causes any drag and detuning, then we'll get rid of it. I put a bone line instead. Okay. So for restringing. Um, what I don't have is my blue lever thing. It's probably under this pile of stuff here. So I'm going to make do with a little motorized version, which uses something that Martin made for me, which is a kind of homemade string winder, which is quite cool. And I'm going to use that. So first thing we do is we line up all the holes, ideally. So if you line up the holes in, the, in a line, a straight line that way, it's much easier to get the strings all the way through. If you like to do it quickishly, you probably can't see this very well. Ugh, come on, up you come. In the air. Right. Uh, what am I doing? I'm lining up the holes first. Line up the holes. There we go. Once we've got them, the strings on, I'll also just double check for these tuners to make sure they're all a little bit tighter than this because a bit rattly at the moment. Doesn't mean they don't work, they're just a bit loose. Right, first string, there you are, through here. What I do is I go all the way through in a straight line, make sure on this guitar, make sure the ball is right up inside the, the block, that, that block in the back. Um, otherwise it will catch on the outside edge. So I pull it all the way through and then this isn't perfect science but the idea is I'll pull back a fret fret's worth and then hold it there and then I'll get this which I haven't used really before much and I'll turn it the other way and I'll basically end up tightening this up and the first time it goes around I'm going to make sure the held string goes above the loose string like that loose string's gone under and I press down with the held string so this time if at all I'm going to pull the loose string up and direct it over the top of the held string. Pretty much at that point, now it comes into, tightens up. 
okay and that that's as little or as much as the of the wire as I'm going to put on there um, and I'm going to cut this short right now so there's not loads of stuff in the way so that's that done so I'll move to the second one straight through again double double check that the the ball of the string is up inside the block pull it taut pull back one fret and then start the winding over, press down, lift up the spare, make the held bit go under. It's a sort of self-locking thing really without without any up with too much wire going onto the tuners. It's a it's a neat way of doing it and I, I tend to do it the same, only by habit really, but it, does, it seems to do the job pretty well. So each time I'm pulling a string's length back, a uh, fret's length, sorry. There's quite a bit of finger gymnastics that goes on in um, loading up strings. When you, you tend to spend a lot of time trying to keep the strings taut so they don't kind of drop back down inside the tremolo block and it's not the end of the world if they do um, but what happens is you'll they'll, they'll seem to jump forward if they start by catching and then release they pop forward and it can be quite a shock when you least expect it you can even go out and play for a few days and then suddenly it goes bang and goes slap So these are Rota Sound 9 gauge, no they're not, they're only only balls, sorry. Super Slanky 9s. Um, I, I used Rota Sound for quite a while, um, just because it, to begin with, they used to give you a free toppy. Which when you stretch the strings as much as I do to get the slack out, was very helpful. So I kept breaking them regularly break a toppy. So I have to be very careful now because I don't have a spare toppy. Now, as we tighten this one up we're going to hook it under this thing called the string tree. Um, these are not my favourite string trees, these metal ones. They sort of work but they can add a little bit of friction uh, if you're using the tremolo and you can get the annoying little pings from using it which can confuse you and make you think that you're getting the pings from tuning problems in the nut when in fact it can be the string tree that's doing it. So if you have a spare 10-15 pounds I recommend you buy a tusk string tree. That's spelled T-U-S-Q and uh, they sell them for strats and tellies. Which is, this is a strat effectively. And they're, they're made of this material called tusk and they do the same job of holding the string down to make sure the angle is correct over the nut but they do it without the pinging and they're a bit less friction which I think is good. Anyway, so here's a secret um, Zando that I think you should you should know um, if there's one of a few things you should know when you play the guitar is once you put the strings on right you need to really stretch the strings um, so I'm going to literally go up and down the strings pressing and stretching with my thumb and forefingers fingers and thumbs so I'm not really pulling on these points here I'm pulling on the points here so it's mostly the stress is between these two points here between my thumbs really and you need to do it for every new set of strings you put on and you probably need to do it three or four or even five times. And the truth is you need to do it until it stops detuning every time you do it. So um, I'm just going through all of the strings and doing it. Now obviously you can't get to the string that's in the saddle, uh, in the block down there, but that's okay. You can, you can get to most of it. Now the toppy is the one that's most likely to break, so be careful. Try not to put too much stress on these points. 
Okay, so there's the first stretch, and then what I'm going to do is get my worst tuner of the world and plug that in, or turn that on. And I want to get a, a, an A. So we get our E, uh, sorry, our A. So some people think that's enough and they go off and play. And they go. Bend a load of strings. And suddenly they're going out of tune again. So I recommend you stretch it again. So that we get as much physically out of the strings before you settle down to play as possible so two or three times at least doing this is my advice and you'll keep getting a bit of detuning every time you do it until it just stops detuning pretty much you almost can't get any more detuning when you do this bending and once you've reached that stage you're ready to go and play and especially it might not be such a problem now at home but if you were in a band later on um, doing this before you go out to play in a gig or practice with your mates is really important because You'll be the only guy who's in tune the whole time throughout the session. Actually, you'll be the only one who stays in tune. See how much it's detuned. So I'm pulling that all of that is what's detuned since I stretched it. So now I'm doing some more stretches, careful ones. Um, by the way, if there are any flaws in your strings, this process will show them up, usually by snapping them, so... See? Detuned again. So we nearly stopped. I'm going to do one more and then they'll call that stretched. Okay, and partly, not only is it good to do that before playing with anybody because you'll be the one who stays in tune where everyone else is constantly fighting with their tuners and stuff. Um, it also that makes this bit that I'm about to do, which is the uh, tremolo setting and the intonation, it makes that much more, much easier to do. So. Um, now, I don't know if you can cast your mind back, it's days for me, but it might only be a matter of minutes for you. If you can cast your mind back to when I did the fret levelling, I did it with pretty much this action, this setup. Nothing's changed since then. Right, so we've got really low action set on here now. Um, now that was set it up low so we did the fret leveling with a really low action on. What's going to happen is I'm going to do two main things now. I'm going to first of all I'm going to intonate, check the intonation of each string now to make sure. Um, I guess the thing is inside. Oh, I'll go and get the tuner. Check the intonation of each string um, and set it 
so that so that it's uh, correct. Now, for your info, the uh, the intonation is just a fancy way of making sure that each string is individually the correct length for this neck. And that seems a bit weird since all the frets are kind of in the same place for each string. They're, they're not like spread out. But what it means is, it, because of the way they're made and the thickness of them, each of these strings requires a slightly different overall length to make the divisions here that you press when you're pressing the frets, to make those divisions equal the proper musical notes. Um, there's a lot of maths and physics involved in why each string needs its own particular length. Um, but just all you need to know is they do. Um, we, we can set that on a bridge like this um, by moving the saddles back, those individual movable bits, which is really cool. Um, now, some guitars have different ways of doing that, and some are really infuriating for me. I find like the... Um, I need more of these, don't I? Uh, I, I find that the Gibson style one is really hard to intonate for various reasons. The Fenders, or the Yamahas like this, with the same Fender style bridge, are really easy or straightforward because you've got a lot of you've got a lot of room to move each saddle backwards and forwards to whatever you need to to get the right intonation, and it's easy to do it because all you have to do is adjust this screw at the back here and. By turning the screw, you either move the saddle that way or that way. So it's a really accessible bridge to use. Uh, the Gibson style tunematic bridge is much harder. And more than once, um, or very often, uh, you can find yourself running out of intonation room on a Gibson style bridge. And sometimes you have to take drastic measures to achieve intonation. If you don't have correct intonation, what it means is that your notes will be progressively more and more out of tune as you go up the neck. Which again, playing with other people, look how nice that looks with those clean um, new, what do you call them? <laughs> Scratch plate screws. Um, yeah, so the more you play, the further you play up the neck, the more out of tune the note becomes if this length overall is wrong. So we, we can set each one, and, what, and the way we do it is a quite a neat way. Um, it's too difficult to measure them physically. What we do is you use a system that uses the 12th fret harmonic. Um, if, this, if the uh, guitar is correct, or the string is correctly intonated, this halfway point harmonic here should be exactly the same as the fretted note. I suggest that the fretted note is sharp. Could be wrong. My my ear thinks it's sharp, but we'll check with a better tuner. So I better go and actually I don't have to go. I'll use this one. I use the one on my phone, but I have to. That means I have to plug in the. Oh, <laughs> I have to plug in my guitar. No, my phone. My phone has to be recharged. It's not going to do it that way. That's because it's unplugged. Holy moly. What have I got left to plug in here or unplug? What's this thing? Oh, that's soldering iron. That's unplugged. Will I be able to do this before my phone dies completely? Maybe. Just. Yeah, just. Yeah, I know the battery's low. Okay, so I have a, a tuner app that I can do this with. So what I'll do is I'll get a strap. Go through the. Ooh, I don't like this strap, but I'll, it'll do for now. Um, I'll go through the hassle of plugging in the amp again because it's kind of vital for doing the intonation. So you can either plug into a directly into a tuner and do it that way, um, or you can do a kind of acoustic version where the, my phone is listening, or the, the tuner app is hearing what the uh, the amp is playing. Anyway, this gives us a, a chance to hear the pickups for a second and plug it in. Hello there. What a hassle, I tell you. Okay. That's worrying. That's not worrying. 
so light. Oh, that's very stretty. A Texas Locos, that is very stratty compared to the Yamaha Originals. That's pretty impressive, actually. So that's the sound of the humbucker. Neck pickup. Quite sharp because you've got um, you've got a humbucker style capacitor working to stop the high frequencies, um, but not as many or not as it doesn't stop as many of the high frequencies as a um, single coil type uh, capacitor. But it just means you just have to use your tone a little bit more. Save that for another time. But in the short term, let's do the intonation thing. So for this, I will need uh, the correct, the correct, the correct screwdriver. Uh, which one is it? Please help me. It's not really that one, is it? Is it in here? No, it's not in there. It's not that one either. Let's find one that will work. Oh boy, let's try that one. Not really the, the ideal one. Where have I put it? So you notice at the moment I'm not doing anything with the tremolo because that's kind of out of the picture at this point in time. I kind of can't find. This is terrible. I'm going to have to buy more of these. Okay, something just went quiet. Why is that just gone quiet? What just happened? That's the first thing. This isn't the right screwdriver. I'm annoyed. That will do, but it's still not quite the right one. Okay, so you want your pickup poles to be about three mils under the strings at the lowest, highest point. Although these are a bit sort of vintage style, so they're made staggered, they call it, which isn't necessary for this kind of guitar. But what the heck. So we can bring them up a bit closer. I think your humbucker is in the right position to start off with, so... first so I'll start with the low E. So the idea is I'm going to tune this 12th fret harmonic. I don't need echo or reverb on it. flat on the fretting. We'll try the next one. Tiny bit flat, but not much. <laughs> Missed the string altogether. Tiny bit flat. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to push these all forward a tiny little bit because flat means the string length is a bit too long. So I'm going to push them all forward by counter going counterclockwise on their little saddles and just make sure they all jump forward and I'll stretch them, make sure they, they're back in or oh, they're not they're not hanging out the back of these little screws. to actually have it on the tre tremel um, treble or the bridge pickup for this. three plain ones, you'll always end up with two staggered groups of three on your bridge, a pattern you'll get to recognise. When it's intonated correctly, when the fretted note of the 12th fret is the same as the harmonic ping of the 12th fret, This will be the shortest string overall on all six. And then we'll go shortest, a bit longer, a bit longer. This one, the first of the wound ones, will jump backwards this way to almost uh, as short as this one. The saddle will come this way and then it will step back again. In, so you get one, two, three, one, two, three. And you'll always end up with that pattern when you have a three wound and three plain strings on almost any and every guitar. If you don't see that pattern, then something has gone wrong. Uh, I need to uh, get the other tuner anyway if I'm going to do this tremolo thing. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that, that will be a good indicator that you've gone wrong. Now sometimes the going wrong can be as much as uh, a dud string in a pack of six. And I found that if you trust this pattern thing, and you put some new strings on and you go to intonate them with your tuner and you find that five seem to be following that pattern and one is miles out of sequence visually here then I would suggest you chuck that string away and get another one or replace the whole pack and it seems a bit horrible to chuck a five quid pack of strings away but I promise you uh, it's something you have to do sometimes occasionally one string in the pack will be dud okay so we're pretty close uh, when I was tuning I didn't hear any notes or any pings coming from this nut which tells me it's in pretty good shape 
Um, so all credit to Yamaha for getting that right in the first place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, pause the video, go and get the uh, tuner that I'll need to do this. And in the meantime, we can start getting the tremolo ready. Now, obviously, it's very tightly screwed down at the moment, so not much is going to happen. I can make it work. Okay. Um, but to set it up properly, we need to get the other tuner. So give me a sec and I'll go and get it. Oh, it's still running. Why is this switch not switched off? Come on now. Okay, here we are with the tuner ready to do the tremolo setting. And it's a really elegant method, which I have written up here because I always refer to it. Um, and it's really simple, but it's, it's amazingly clever and it gets there every time. So what we do, we have the thing set so we can tune. And now right now, it's not too important, by the way, that um, the guitar is lying down. People get all, one of the other myths about everything is you have to do everything in the playing position. It's not true. You can do this bit in this position. Uh, it will still work. So what I'm aiming to do is I'm going to use a combination of things, very clever things. I'm going to use, this is called the Galeazzo Frudua method. An Italian luthier on YouTube showed me how to do this. Right. So yeah, what I do is I get um, okay so the first thing I do is I look at this thing and is it horizontal? Yes it's horizontal. Okay so that's the first thing I have to do. Second thing I have to do is I have to push down uh, uh, right, tune the G string to pitch, which it pretty much is. Then I have to push down until it becomes an E. Is that mad? Then I have to put in as many post it notes as needed to hold it in that position, which is also mad. More. And I keep going with post-it notes until I've got as many under there as it takes to t tune the E down to, sorry, to tune the G down to an E, which is quite good. Nearly there. One more piece of sheet, and we'll, we'll have it done. Yay! There we are. That's an E. Now all I do is I tune it all up again, and I go back up to G, B. E. D. So Tom, if you're taking an interest in this, this is a really elegant way of doing this. By using the post-it notes and this tuning down and then what we're going to do next, what we're doing is we're building in a, a given range of pitch bend in a really elegant way. You can read endless kind of books forever and get completely confused on tremolos. So I'll just check the tuning right. E. A. D. G. B. Then, once you've got that in tune, take the post-it notes out and let go, but watch what happens. Go sharp. Here's the magic of the system. You then get the screwdriver and you use tune the claw, you let the claw bolt out. Right, I won't show you me doing it, but you do them equal to each other until that G which is not a G at the moment, becomes a G again. So you're now detuning using the claw, tremolo claw bolts to slacken the amount of pull on the uh, springs. And what you'll notice at some point is that the tremolo comes forward. So I'm on A at the moment on the string that should be a G. 
if I slack this off some more, it'll come down and eventually we'll come down to where that string has become a G again. Still on A. It'll take a while before it moves, but then it will go down quite progressively. And when we end up with the guitar back in roughly in tune, then we will have the tremolo with the correct amount of movement in it. So we're still not there yet, still holding it in position. So any minute now. Now it's going down below the A and we'll be heading towards G sharp and then A, uh, G sharp and then G. I can't remember the order things happening. G sharp. Now you'll see that the end of this is kicked up now and it's starting to rise above the body of the guitar, which is correct. That's what you have to have if you want backwards bend movement with your floating tremolo. The question has always been how much does it have to be off the deck? And, and that little procedure I just did with the post-it notes is a way of specifying without the trial and error. And it's a beautifully elegant little system, thanks to our Italian luthier friend, Sharp of G. So we're we're now only a few turns away from tune. See, it's almost on G now, like half a turn here, quarter of a turn there, we'll be on G, or below. Yeah, we're flat now, I need to come back up, so we'll tighten that up a little bit. G! Now watch this. You can see the tremolo kicked up at the back. That's the amount of room we have to have in order to get the upwards pitch bend you want. Now what I'll do is I'll just screw this in. This is a little bit stiff, so it's not the best thing. It's got a tiny bit of give because it's not the right, exactly the right thing. But um, I'm wondering if we could improve this with a bit of shrink wrap or something. Kind of doesn't want to do all the way up. We could, let's see if we can go around one more time. Yeah, that's probably cutting a nice new screw. There we go. See how it returns to pitch? So people would have told you that's not possible on the cheap Strat. Just check the tuning, get it all perfect. There you have it. Intonated, tremolo set floating. Um, it's quite stiff, but you you can it'll it'll ease up, but you don't want it rattling because it's not perfect fit. You don't want that mount rattle in it. So you want to go around till it's fairly stiff, um, and that's it's not quite you you know these are cheap systems. They don't the arm is never perfect on these. So if you can if you can at least have it nearby and get it to move without any too much slack or slop in the uh, arm, you're, uh, you're the head of the game. Now what this has done is because it's tilted forward, the last thing I'm going to do is check the action because it will have raised it slightly, um, but I think it feels nice as it is. And we'll check it and that's 1.5 and lo and behold that's the target one, so we're back exactly where I want it to be. What this gives you, that, that little calculation that Galeazzo Fruduo's method does, um, it gives you a t a half a tone back. Tone on the B, a half a tone on the E, tone on the B. Get it in the right 
my position. And then a uh, tone and a half on the G. It's almost there, it's a tiny bit flat of that, but it's not far off. That's brilliant that it plays in tune. So there, ladies and gentlemen, we have it. Um, I would send this back with this off. Uh, and like I say, it will be a, a little bit rattly until it bites at the end of it. So it looks in good condition. So I don't think it's doing any harm. If you want to, if possible, you could. It is possible sometimes to improve it a little bit by throwing, oh God, tipping things out, um, by chucking a spring into there. And it depends, I'm not going to do it, but you could experiment by putting a little spring in the bottom, so long as it doesn't go all the way through, and this can then sit on the spring and put it under tension before you end up locking it um, because of the over tightening the uh, thread. Anyway, Tom, that was for your kind of info. Um, Xander, I hope you enjoy this um, reloved Yamaha guitar. Well, it's a Yamaha, but it's been reloved, so um, now we're going to put the back plate on. They're designed like this, so you should be able to change the strings without taking this plate off. But you may find it's actually a lot easier to take the plate off, despite what they say. So I recommend you probably do. But the idea is that you can restring it without that. But it can get a bit difficult to get the string ball, the balls of the strings out. Um, but yeah, this you know it's a nice demonstration. This that a budget guitar tremolo that's actually very light and insubstantial. Um, can stay in tune so long as the two main things, by the way there's a tiny split on here so I'm going to not do it up too tight, I'll slack off a bit. Um, as long as two things are met, one is the nut slots are the correct width and they're not grabbing the strings and the second one is that the strings have had all the slack stretch out of them. And those two things on any guitar Xander, if you're going to stay playing the guitar, are things to learn how to take care of because you'll get much more enjoyment if you can learn how to do that and then if you're kind of interested you can learn how to do the fret leveling like I did as well and then you'll be you'll be in heaven with low action guitars because there'll be no limit to what you can do but this is pretty much done so I'm gonna say um, thank you for sending it down hope you enjoy playing it hope you had a good Christmas by the time you see this video and um, yeah, thanks for coming to Real Love Guitars.